single phase single phase motors are of two types they are called as a reluctance type synchronous motor and asynchronous type synchronous motor so i have already told you in the synchronous motor concept itself single phase synchronous motors are of two types single phase synchronous motors are of two types one is called as reluctance type synchronous motor and the other one is called as the asynchronous type synchronous motor so single phase synchronous motors are of two types one is called as the reluctance type synchronous motor and the asynchronous type synchronous motor so these are the two different types of single phase synchronous motors the single phase synchronous motors are of two types one is called as the reluctance type synchronous motor and the asynchronous type synchronous motor so these are the two different types of synchronous motors which are called as a single phase synchronous motors so single phase synchronous motors are of two types one is called as the reluctance type synchronous motor and the other is called as the asynchronous type synchronous motor so single phase synchronous motors are of two types they are called as reluctance type synchronous motor and the asynchronous type synchronous motor the equation of active power in reluctance type synchronous motor is and reluctance stop see basically the equation of active power in reluctance type synchronous motor is and reluctance stop see i want to give you the equation of the active power and also the the torque the reluctance stop in this reluctance type of synchronous motor so what is that equation which is p is equal to e into v by x d into sin delta plus v square by 2 into x d minus x cube by x d into x cube into sin delta delta but p is nothing but p is equal to see p is equal to p into omega p is equal to p by omega so if you do if you do the p by omega we are going to get 60 by p by n is into v square by 2 into x d minus x cube by x d into x cube into sin delta delta this component you are not going to get you have to take only this component so only this component that you have to take so p is equal to t into omega t is equal to p by omega if you divide this one by omega we are going to get like this which is p is equal to 1 by omega which is 2 pi minus by 60 into v square by 2 into x d minus x cube by x d into x cube into sin delta so p is a function of sin delta and sin delta but t is a function of only sin delta so these two formulas that we always have to remember so we simply we can say that the equation of the active power and also the the reluctance torque in the case of the reluctance type single synchronous motor i already told you single phase synchronous motors are two types one is called as reluctance type synchronous motor and the other is called as asynchronous type synchronous motor and it active power equation and torque equation is basically called as reluctance torque of the reluctance type of synchronous motor p is equal to e into v by x d into sin delta plus v square by 2 into x d minus x cube by x d into x cube into sin delta so this is general equation e v by x d into sin delta so this is v square by 2 into x d minus x cube by x d into x cube into sin delta this is the thing which we can easily get here or simply we can say this 1 by x cube minus 1 by x d also you can write this is 1 by x cube minus 1 by x d also you can write 1 by x cube minus 1 by x d also you can write so p p is equal to into omega t is equal to p by omega you have to take only this part now only this part you have to take so if you take this part and if you divide by omega you are going to get the reluctance part like this so these are the three important equations that you always have to remember so p is a function of sin delta and sin d delta but p is a function of only sin d delta so these are the important things that you always need to keep in mind the equation of active power in a success type synchronous motor so now i will discuss what is the equation of the active power in success type synchronous motor which is very simple p is equal to v by x s into sin delta so this is a very important thing see in the case of reluctance only i have already told you what is the active power and torque but in case of hysteresis synchronous motor p is equal to v by x s into sin delta then p is equal to t into omega so p is equal to p by omega just two by just this divided p by omega you are going to get the torque in the hysteresis type synchronous motor also you are going to get the expansion so these are the important things that you always have to keep in your mind so therefore the equation of the active power in hysteresis type synchronous motor is equal to p is equal to v by x s into sin delta so these are the important things that you always have to keep in mind i have already told you single phase synchronous motors are of two types one is called reluctance type synchronous motor and other is called as hysteresis type synchronous motor and the active power equation and the reluctance torque equation in case of reluctance type single phase synchronous motor is nothing but p is equal to v by x d into sin delta plus v square by 2 into 1 by x cube minus 1 by x d into sin delta so t is equal to p, p, p by omega so you have to take only sin to delta part 
powered by omega, which is finally you are going to get 60 by 2 pi ms into v square by 2 into 1 by x q minus 1 by x d into sin 2 delta. Whereas if you want to find what is the equation of the active power in the SP type single phase synchronous motor, which is very simple, E is equal to V by X S into sin delta. See, AC series motor, I have already told you, AC series motor is also called as a universal motor. It is basically used in the food mixers, grinders, juicers, portable drilling machines, tools, vacuum cleaners, recent automatic washing machines, hair dryers, hand dryers, and air, electric shavers, etc. This make very large sound and this are also called as universal motor or fraction kilowatt motor. See AC motor means basically it is also called as a universal motor or fractional kilowatt motor. Basically it is basically diagram is similar to a DC series motor but it can work for both AC and DC supply also. But it makes large amount of sound. This is basically used in the food mixers. You can listen whenever you are a food mixer it makes huge amount of noise because of moving huge amount of speed. So we can say it makes large amount of noise. It is basically used in the food mixers, grinders, juicers, portable drilling machines, tools, vacuum cleaners, recent automatic washing machines, hair dryers and hand dryers and also electric shavers, etc. So these make very large sound and these are also called as universal motor or the fraction kilowatt motor. So these are different names of this one. So AC series motor is also called as the universal motor or fraction kilowatt motor. I have already told you it works on both AC and DC supply and it makes huge amount of sound and is basically used in the food mixers, grinders, juicers, portable drilling machine tools, vacuum cleaners, recent automatic washing machines, hair dryers, hand dryers, electric shavers, etc. And this makes very large sound and is also called as a universal motor or traditional kilowatt motor. Solid state regulators are finding favor in speed control of domestic fans over conventional resistance and inductor type regulators because Solid state regulators are compactly, co compact relatively less expensive, energy efficient, more reliable, and afford nice the operation. I already told you solid state regulators means we can, they are basically, in the previous case, we need to get a huge amount of regulator, huge size of regulator to control the speed of a fan. But nowadays you can see the small amount of regulators are, are going to get basically because of the huge amount of they have less space they can acquire the less space and they are very efficient and also they doesn't make any noise and they are very less expensive also so because of these reasons only the solid state regulators are becoming very famous when compared to conventional the resistance and inductor type regulators these things you can see generally in your home also so therefore the solid the solid state regulators are finding favor in speed control of domestic fans over conventional resistance and in a type type regulators because solid state regulators are compactly a compact to less expensive, energy efficient and more reliable and afford nice to operation. See basically the solid state regulators yes, they are basically made by power electronic devices so they can save the energy and they are more reliable and it doesn't make any noise free because they are static devices and also they are very less expensive. Because of all these crazy things only nowadays we are going to use the solid state regulators when compared to conventional resistance and inductant type regulators. So solid state regulators are finding favor in speed control of domestic fans over conventional resistance and inductant type regulators because solid state regulators are compactly to less expensive, energy efficient and more reliable and afford the nice free operation. So solid state regulators are finding favor in speed control of domestic fans over conventional resistance and inductance type regulators because solid state regulators are compact, relatively less expensive, energy efficient, more reliable and afford nice free operation. So whatever the solid state regulators are finding favor in speed control of domestic fans over conventional resistance and inductor type type regulators because solid state regulators are compact related to less expensive, energy efficient and more reliable and afford nice free operation. Stepper motors are basically used in printers come to printer drive. I already told you stepper, stepper motors means they are going to make the rotation in the terms of steps. These stepper motors are basically used in the printers and also in the computer printer drive. And I already told you suppose in a fan, below the fan the cooling, the cooling fan, whatever you are going to use below the laptop, which are basically made by single phase electrical induction motor. These things I have already told you. Whenever the stepper motors are used in the printers, computer printer drive, in all these applications we are going to use the stepper motor because there we need the uh, step angle, the whatever the rotation of the rotor, we need to have the step angle, step angle for the 
then that applications will need the step angle of rotation so therefore stepper motors are used in that applications so stepper motors are used in printers come to that printer drive the following are some proof facts regarding the single phase electric motor i already told you i already told you single phase internal motors are of two types one is called as the electric type single phase internal motor and this is type single phase internal motor so now we will discuss some important points regarding the some facts regarding the single phase electric motor the starting torque is a function of rotor position so what are the starting torque we are going to get function of rotor position i already told you torque is nothing but the expression of the electric torque of this electric motor is nothing but i already told you the torque is equal to 60 by 2 pi ns into v square by 2 into xd minus or you can say 1 by xq minus 1 by xt into sin phi delta so delta is nothing but position so the starting torque is a function of rotor position the torque developed at subsequent speed varies sensibly so what are the torque developed at the subsequent at the subsequent speed varies sensibly because the function of sin phi delta starting is asynchronous but running is synchronous so starting is always asynchronous but running is always synchronous so therefore we can say that that the important points that you always have to keep in your mind whenever you think about the whenever you think about this one so therefore simply we can say that this single phase synchronous motor doesn't need any excitation also see this single phase synchronous motor doesn't even need any excitation so these are some of the important facts regarding this uh, single phase electric motor see the starting torque is a function of rho rotor position we call it sin phi delta the torque developed at the subsequent speed varies sin phi delta because the function of sin phi delta so starting is asynchronous but running is always synchronous and asynchronous means ns is not equal to nr initially but finally ns is always equal to nr this single phase synchronous motor doesn't need any excitation so here we don't need any field excitation for this one so for this for this electric motor it doesn't need any excitation so for the single phase motor synchronous motor especially of this electric type it doesn't need any excitation any field excitation is not required so simply we can say that these are some of the important facts regarding the single phase electric motor so what are the starting torque is a function of rotor position the torque developed at the subsequent speed varies sensibly and the starting is always asynchronous but running is always synchronous and this single phase synchronous motor which is a electric type synchronous motor it doesn't need any field excitation so these are the some of the important facts regarding this single phase electric synchronous motor so finally i can say that the following are some of the proof facts regarding this electric single phase synchronous motor which is what are the starting torque is a function of rotor position because torque is proportional to sin phi delta so it's also proportional to delta so torque developed at the subsequent speed speed very sensible because torque is proportional to sin phi delta which is a function of sin starting is always asynchronous means ns is not equal to nr starting but running is always ns is equal to ns nr is synchronous this single phase electric type synchronous motor that doesn't require any excitation i already told you field excitation field excitation is not at all required for this single phase synchronous single phase electric synchronous motor to ensure that a two phase induction motor type servo motor does not run when the control phase voltage is zero the ratio of rotor leakage resistance reactors to rotor purpose should be less than 1 so whenever whenever the whenever the ratio of the rotor leakage reactance to rotor phase resistance should be less than 1 then only we can we can show that to ensure that the two phase induction motor induction type servo motor does not run when the control phase voltage is zero so whenever the control phase voltage is equal to zero because servo motor has two windings one is called as a control winding and other is called as a basically there are two windings are going to present so whenever the control phase voltage is equal to zero ideally the rotor should stop so this is going to stop only whenever the x bar is less than 1 so this is the important point whenever the control phase voltage is equal to zero the rotor should not rotate because the condition is whenever the x bar less than 1 you can ensure that whenever the control voltage is equal to zero the rotor will never rotate we ensure that the two phase induction type servo motor does not run when the control phase voltage is zero the ratio of the if the ratio of the rotor leakage reactance to rotor phase resistance should be less than 1 so whenever the ratio of the rotor leakage reactance to rotor phase resistance is less than 1 then we can confirm that whenever the control voltage is equal to zero the the rotor will never rotate it will always stop so we can see that to ensure that a two phase induction type servo motor does not run when the control phase voltage is zero 
the ratio of the rotor leakage reactance to the rotor phase resistance should be less than 1. So finally I can conclude that whatever these two phase induction type servo motor, whenever the control only is equal to 0, it must shock. The condition for that is very simple, which is x bar always less than 1. x is far as the rotor leakage reactance and r is far as the rotor surface resistance. The generated voltage in a three phase supply contains harmonics because the angular variation of the radial component of the magnetic flux in the air gap is not a two sided sort. Reason the generated voltage in three phase supply contains harmonics because the angular variation of the radial component of the magnetic flux in the air gap is not a two sided sort. The generated voltage in three phase supply contains harmonics because the angular variation of the radial component of the magnetic flux in the air gap is not a pure sensor. So whatever the generated voltage in a three-phase supply, so whatever the generated voltage in a three-phase supply contains harmonics because the angular variation of the radial component of the magnetic flux in the air gap is not a pure sensor. So because because the radial component of the because of the radial component of the magnetic flux in the air gap is not a pure sensor. So we can say that whatever the generated voltage will definitely contain the harmonics. So whenever the whenever the radial component of the magnetic flux in the air gap is not a pure sensor, definitely we can say whatever the generated voltage in a three-phase supply always contains the harmonics. So whenever the radial component of the magnetic flux in the air gap is not a pure sensor, then we can say that whatever the generated voltage in a three-phase supply definitely contains the harmonics. So we can say whenever the angular variation of the radial component of the magnetic flux in the air gap is not a pure sensor, definitely we can say that whatever the generated voltage in a three-phase supply always contains harmonics. So whenever the whenever the angular variation of the radial component of the magnetic flux in the air gap is not a pure sensor, definitely we can say the generated voltage in a three-phase supply contains the harmonics. So for a given load, the speed of shared pole single phase induction motor fluctuates slightly because the amount of the magnetic field is not constant. For a given load, the speed of the shared pole, sing shared pole single phase induction motor fluctuates slightly because the amount of the magnetic field is not constant. See, whenever the amount of the magnetic field is not constant, definitely we can say the speed is going to get fluctuate because speed is a function of magnetic field. So whenever the magnetic field changes, the speed is also going to get changed. It is going to fluctuate. So therefore, for a given load, the speed of a shared pole single phase induction motor fluctuates slightly because the magnitude of the magnetic field is not constant. So whenever the magnitude of the magnetic field is not constant, simply we can say that the speed is also going to get fluctuate. So whenever the magnitude of the magnetic field is fluctuating, definitely the speed is also going to get fluctuate in case of the shared pole single phase induction motor. I already told you in a shared pole single phase induction motor, always the road, the motor is always going to get from large shared part to the shared part and always whatever the flux in the shared part will always lag in compared to flux in the non shared part. These things I have already told you. So always when compared to remaining other single phase induction motors, the starting charge of the shared part single phase induction motor is always less. And so many things I have already told you here, always for a given load, the speed of the shared part single phase induction motor fluctuates slightly because the magnitude of the magnetic field is not constant. So for a given load, the speed of the shared pulse in reverse induction motor fluctuates slightly because the magnitude of the magnetic field is not constant. Whenever the magnitude of the magnetic field is not constant, similarly, similarly the speed is going to get fluctuated in case of the shared pulse in reverse induction motor. In the sleeve range of a stepper motor, it cannot start, stop and reverse on command. In the sleeve range of a stepper motor, it cannot start, stop and reverse on command. So basically the stepper motor does a sleeve range. In that range, it cannot start, it cannot stop, and it cannot reverse on the command. So on the command, it cannot start, it cannot stop, and also it cannot reverse based on the command. So in this new range, even you give the command, it, it can't start, it can't stop, and it can't reverse based on the command. So therefore, simply we can say that in the slow range of the stepper motor, it cannot start, it cannot stop, and it cannot reverse on command. So these are the important things that you always have to keep in your mind. So in the slave range of a stepper motor, based on the command, it will never work. Suppose if you are going to give a start, it will never start. If you give a command of stop, it will never stop. If you give a command of reverse, it will never reverse. So this is possible, only, this is the case which is possible only in the slave range. So in the slave range of a stepper motor, it cannot start, it cannot stop, and it cannot reverse on command. So 
డైరెక్ట్లీ ఇన్ స్టెప్ అండ్ మోటర్ దర్ ఇస్ అ పక్లర్ దిస్ కాలర్ ఇస్ న్యూ రేంజ్ ఇన్ ఇస్ న్యూ రేంజ్ ఇఫ్ యూ గివ్ ఏ కమాండ్ ఆఫ్ స్టార్ట్ ఇట్ విల్ నెవర్ స్టార్ట్ ఇఫ్ యూ గివ్ ఏ కమాండ్ ఆఫ్ స్టార్ట్ ఇట్ విల్ నెవర్ స్టార్ట్ అండ్ ఇఫ్ యూ గివ్ ఏ కమాండ్ ఆఫ్ రివర్స్ ఇట్ విల్ నెవర్ రివర్స్ సో ఇన్ ఇస్ న్యూ రేంజ్ ఆఫ్ స్టెప్ అండ్ మోటర్ ఇట్ కెన్ నాట్ స్టార్ట్ ఇట్ కెన్ నాట్ స్టార్ట్ ఇట్ కెన్ నాట్ రివర్స్ ఆన్ ది కమాండ్ so some points on the single phase synthesis motor i have already told you the synthesis motor is basically a single phase synthesis motor i have already told you single phase synthesis motors are of two types one is called as the reluctance type single phase synthesis motor synthesis type single phase synthesis motor so now we will discuss some important points regarding the single phase synthesis motor the torque at starting is same it is it is it is start the torque at starting is some lot more than that of the sequence speed ns so torque at starting torque at starting is somewhat more than that of the sequence speed ns so we can say the starting torque is somewhat higher than compared to sequence speed torque so rotor material possesses very high wide resistance to because it is going to work on the fault work on the principle of stresses loss so if you want more stress loss go for the more stress loop so we have to choose a material the rotor material that has a wider stress loop so therefore because this is going to work on the principle of stress loss so more stress loop more stress loss so it is going to work properly so we have to choose the rotor material which is having a by stress loop and the rotor is provided with smooth slots embedded with bars so basically the rotor we are going to choose some smooth slots in that we are going to use the bars so these are some of the important points regarding the stress loss of motor so basically we can say whatever the torque at the starting is somewhat higher than compared to torque at the sequence speed and the rotor material which is going to possess a very wide stress loss because this work is going to work on the principle of stress loss so whatever the rotor which is provided it must have design the smooth slots which are embedded with bars so these are some of the important facts regarding the stress motor so whatever the torque at the starting is somewhat higher than compared to torque at the sequence speed ns and what are the rotor material it is having the why this is a slope because it is going to work on the principle of stress loss so more stress loop more stress loss so it is going to work properly and what are the rotor it is covered with smooth slots with emerald bars a single phase inertial motor is rotating in a clockwise direction forward with the speed l if the rotor resistance and stress tension is r not then the effect to rotor resistance in the backward direction in the backward direction branch of the equivalent circuit will be i all i told you we have to split it to two parts one for the forward and one for the backward which is see basically it is called as the first in the equivalent circuit diagram the overall resistance is r not by s yes. but now we have to make two equal parts so r not by 2 forward slip and r not by 2 into backward slip so that for we are going to get here in this question they are asking about the backward slip so for r not by 2 into backward slip is equal to 2 minus forward slip So therefore, SF is equal to the forward slip is equal to NS minus NR by NS and NS is equal to 120 by P. So, whatever in the, in the induction motor, see in the induction motor, I have already told you, the equal resistance is R not by S. Perfect diagram. So, we have to make it into two equal parts. So, R not by 2 into forward slip, R not by 2 into backward slip. So, so backward slip is equal to 2 minus forward slip. So, this is the way that we have to do this one. A single phase induction motor is rotating in the clock post direction in the forward the speed in if the rotor resistance at the start is r not then the effect to rotor resistance in the backward direction branch of the equivalent circuit will be r not by 2 into backward slip is equal to 2 minus forward slip and a forward slip is equal to ns minus nr by ns and ns is equal to 120 by p electrons type motor if the stator magnetic field angular velocity is omega and the actual rotor angular velocity is omega then the average electromagnetic torque is not zero is not zero for omega is equal to omega r. So we can say that I have already told you the electrons type motor is nothing but it is a single phase. See, I have already told you single phase synchronous motors are of two types of the single phase synchronous motors are of two types of the one is called as the hysteresis type single phase synchronous motor and the electrons type single phase synchronous motor. So for a electrons type motor, if the stator magnetic field angular velocity is omega and the actual rotor angular velocity is omega r, then the average electromagnetic torque is not zero whenever the omega is equal to omega r. So basically, whenever the omega is equal to omega r, whatever the average torque, whatever the average torque we are going to produce, it is not equal to zero in the case of this electrons type motor. So electrons type motor. So therefore, whenever omega is equal to omega r, the average electromagnetic torque is not equal to zero in the case of this electrons type motor. 
without the single phase synchronous motor only. So for the electrons type motor, it is stator, magnetic field, angular velocity is omega, and the actual motor, angular velocity is omega. Then the average electromagnetic torque is not equal to zero for omega is equal to omega. So for a electrons type motor, if the stator magnetic field angular velocity is omega, and the actual motor angular velocity is omega, then the average electromagnetic torque is not equal to zero for omega is equal to omega. So for electrons type motor, if the stator magnetic field angular velocity is omega, and the actual motor angular velocity is omega, then the average electromagnetic torque is not equal to zero for omega is equal to omega. A capacitor starts single phase induction motor is used to turn hard to start loads. I already told you, if you use a capacitor, you are going to increase the phase angle between the IM and IA. IM is called as the, the current in the main valley, IA is called as the current in the altered valley. If you increase the alpha, then sine alpha increases, then the sine torque will increase because sine torque is there to proportional to IM into IA into sine alpha. So if you use the capacitor as alpha increases, definitely we can say that as alpha increases, the sine alpha increases, so sine torque will increase. So whichever the loads, whichever the motor, which are very hard to start, with the help of capacitor, we can increase the alpha. If you increase the alpha, sine alpha increases, the sine torque increases. So therefore, it can easily start the motor. So therefore, simply we can say that the capacitor starts in the induction motor is used for hard to start loads. There are some loads which can't start. So because of this, now we can increase the starting torque, so it can easily rotate that one. Even the hard loads can also be rotated with the help of this. Even the hard, we can see heavy loads, hard to start loads or heavy loads, we can easily rotate with the help of this capacitor star single phase induction motor. Universal motors are used in the hand tool applications and it is a, and it is a single phase AC motor. I have already told you, universal motor is also called as the fractional kilowatt motor or AC motor. These things I have already told you very much in the detail in the previous class only. So whatever the universal motors are basically used in the hand tool applications and it is a single phase AC motor. It is basically a single phase AC motor and it can, and it can be used for both AC and DC supply. So whatever the universal motor is also called as a fractional kilowatt motor. It is basically used in the food mixers, grinders, juicers, portable building machine tools, vacuum cleaners and the recent automatic washing machines, hair dryers also and hand dryers also we can use. Electric shavers. These are very. These are having a very large sound. Large sound, and it's also called as universal motor of the fractional kilowatt motor. I have already told this important point. So universal motors are used in hand tool applications, and it is a basically single phase AC motor. An elementary cylindrical machine has one full pitch coil in the stator, but the rotor may have two poles or four poles of permanent magnets. The time varying voltage that could be included in the stator coil for one rotation of the rotor while the rotor is devolving at a constant speed. An elementary cylindrical machine has one full pitch coil in the stator, but the rotor may have two poles or four poles of permanent magnets. The time varying voltage that could be induced in the stator coil for one rotation of the rotor while the rotor is revolving at a constant speed. An elementary cylindrical machine has one full pitch coil in the stator, but the rotor may have two poles or four poles of magnetic of permanent magnets. The time varying voltage that could be into the stator coil for one rotation of the rotor while the rotor is revolving at a constant speed. For P poles on rotor, for one rotation of rotor, we get P by 2 full cycles of voltage in the stator coils. So this is a very important point. For P poles on rotor, for one rotation of rotor, we get P by 2 full cycles of voltage in the stator coils. So if P poles are voted on the rotor and for one rotation of the rotor, Suppose if P poles are on the rotor, for one rotation of rotor, we are going to get P by 2 full cycles of voltage in the stator coils. Suppose in the stator there is a coils and the rotor we are going to keep some poles. If you give a, for P poles on the rotor, for one rotation of the rotor, suppose P poles are, suppose P poles are there on the rotor and for one rotation of the rotor, then we are going to get P by 2 full cycles of voltage we are going to get in the stator coils. So for P poles on rotor, for one rotation of the rotor, we get P by 2 full cycles of voltage in the stator coils. I have already told you very important point here. Whenever P poles are there on the stator, whenever the P poles are there, there on the stator, and if you give P by 2 cycles of the supply, then we are going to get one rotation of the LDR flux. In the case of induction motor, I have already told you, listen carefully, in the, in the case of induction machine, if suppose P poles are moved on stator and if we give P by 2 cycles of AC supply, then we are going to get one rotation of the AC flux. 
Similarly, in the case of synchronous machine, suppose if three poles are there on the rotor, and for one rotation of the rotor, we are going to get P by 2 pole cycles of voltage in the second coils. So, in the case of synchronous machine, if three poles are there on the rotor, and for one rotation of the rotor, we are going to get P by 2 pole cycles of voltage in the second coils. Whereas in the case of induction machine, if P poles are worn on the stator, and if we give P by 2 cycles of resistance supply, then we are going to get one rotation of the air gap flux. Whereas in the case of synchronous machine, if P poles are there on the rotor, and for one rotation of the rotor, we are going to get P by 2 pole cycles of voltage in the stator coils. General purpose speed phase, full horsepower motors used in fans and doors. I have already told you the general purpose split phase. FHP motors, you can say full or four motors used in fans and blowers. So whatever the fans and blowers, whatever you see, there you are going to use the split phase F FHP motors, you can say full HP motors. So here the general purpose split phase, full HP motors used in the fans and blowers. So general purpose split phase FHP motors are used in the fans and also in the blowers. So general purpose split phase FHP motors are used in the fans and the blowers. So general purpose speed phase FHV motors are used in the fans and the blowers. General purpose capacitor start FHV motors are used in refrigerators. So listen carefully, the general purpose capacitor start FHV motors are used in refrigerators. Whereas the permanent speed capacitor start FHV motors are used in unit heaters, are used in unit heaters. Whereas the shared pole FHV motors are used in head dryers, which are used in the head dryers. So basically we can say that the split phase FHV motors are used in fans and blowers, whereas the, the capacitor start FHV motors are used in refrigerators, whereas the split capacitors, the permanent split capacitor start FHV motors are used in neon heaters, whereas the shaded pole FHV motors are used in hair dryers. So, shaded pole FHV motors are used in hair dryers, capacitor start FHV motors are used in neon heaters, and the capacitor start FHV motors are used in refrigerators and the split phase FHV motors are used in fans and blowers. So listen carefully, general purpose split phase FHV motors are used in fans and blowers and general purpose capacitor start FHV motors are used in refrigerators and the permanent split capacitors start FHV motors are used in new heaters and shared pole FHV motors are used in head dryers. So these are the different types of motors and their applications. So general purpose split phase FHV motors are used in fans and blowers. General purpose capacitor start FHV motors are used in refrigerators. And the permanent split capacitors start FHV motors are used in jute heaters. And the shaded pole FHV motors are used in heat dryers. Now a synchronous motor has no starting torque. But when started it is always runs at fixed speed. I have already told you a synchronous motor has no starting torque. But when started, it always runs at the fixed speed. Say, so all I told you basically, a three phase synchronous motor is not a self starting motor. So, if you want to make it starting, so if you want to basically start it, I have already told you there are two methods by which we can go for the starting. One is called as the, you have to keep some extra auxiliary motor to make it a given, you have to give a starting rotation. And the second one is basically, which is called as the damper winding. So, these are the two methods by which we can go for the starting of a three phase synchronous motor. So, we can say that a three phase synchronous motor has no starting term, but when started, it always runs at a fixed speed, which is equal to NR is equal to NS. A single phase reluctance motor is not self starting, even if parts for anti currents are provided in the rotor. I have already told you a single phase reluctance motor is called as the, it is a one of the type of the single phase synchronous motor. I have already told you a single phase synchronous motor is of two types and is called as a reluctant single phase synchronous motor and also the distance is single phase synchronous motor. So a single phase reluctant motor is not self-starting even if pass for decurrence are provided in the rotors. Even, even they have the decurrence initially but still there will be no initial torque and we can say that they are, these are basically non self starting motors. A three phase synchronous motor and also a single phase synchronous motor both are said to be we can say that they have the no starting torque and we can say these are not self starting motors. Whereas a three phase induction motor is a self starting whereas single phase induction motor is non self starting. Whereas in the case of synchronous motor a three phase synchronous motor and also a single phase synchronous motor both these are said to be non self starting motors or simply we can say these are not self starting motors. 
So his thinking is left on smooth, there is not the rest of him. Even if parts for indicators are provided in their rotors. A single phase lectern smooth, there is not the rest of him. Even if parts for indicators are provided in the rotor. Similarly, a single phase incident smooth, there is also non self starting. Same thing I have already told you. So, a three phase synchronous motor is a non self starting. A single phase synchronous motor is also non self starting. I have already told you in a single phase synchronous motor, there are two types of synchronous motors which is called as the hysteresis synchronous motor and the, 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 the reluctant synchronous motor. Both these are both these are said to be non-self-starting or we can say these are not self-starting motors. So a single phase hysteresis motor, a single phase reluctance motor, both are said to be non-self-starting or we can say they have the initial start initial start key, the start torque is equal to zero in these two cases. So finally I can say that a single phase lecture motor is not self starting even if phosphor indicators are provided in the rotor. Similarly, a single phase is this motor is not self starting. I have already told you Easter this motor is going to work on the principle of research losses, whereas electron motor is going to work on the principle of indicator losses. Synchronous generators used almost worldwide, but induction generators are very lessly used because of the variable frequency output. I have already told you synchronous out of generators, out of H generators, synchronous generators is mostly preferred when compared to induction generator because for synchronous generator the output frequency is always constant whereas for induction generators the output frequency is a variable one. So because of these reasons only the synchronous generators are always preferred when compared to induction generators. Whereas in the terms of motors, always the induction motors are more preferred when compared to synchronous motor. All these concepts I have already told you. So therefore, synchronous generators used almost worldwide, but induction generators are very lessly used because of variable frequency output. So we can say that synchronous generators used almost worldwide, but induction generators are lessly used because of the variable frequency output. By Fleming right hand rule, we can figure out the direction of the current in generator and by Fleming left hand rule, we can figure out the electrical torque due to that current produced in generator and it is going to oppose the prime over torque. See so listen carefully, it is a very important thing, I have already told you this important point always in the DC machine itself. See Fleming right hand rule is basically used in the generator, Fleming left hand rule, see Fleming right hand rule is, is used in the generator. The thumb is going to indicate the torque or force. This force is basically electrical torque or electrical force. And uh, so basically whatever the force that you are chosen here, the thumb direction is always the mechanical torque, not the electrical torque. Small mistake here. So whatever the thumb is going to show you, the right hand thumb, it is going to show you the mechanical torque. Whereas the, uh, the four finger is going to represent the flux and the, the middle finger is going to represent the current. So the basic principle is F V I. So if you use the right hand thumb rule, I already told you in a generator, the torque we know and also flux we know, but the only thing is the unknown quantity is the current direction, we can easily figure out with the help of the Fleming right hand rule. But if you want to use the Fleming left hand rule, you can even use the Fleming, le Fleming left hand rule, but small correction here is, by using the Fleming, the Fleming, Fleming left hand rule, whatever the thumb it is going to show you the electrical torque, it is going to show the electrical torque direction, always the electrical torque direction is always opposite to the mechanical torque direction. So you can use the Fleming left hand rule also, but whatever the thumb it is always the electrical torque it is always opposite to the mechanical torque or I have already told you the general formula to represent F cap is equal to I cap plus B cap here F cap is always going to show you the electrical force or electrical torque so if you know this simple concept then always electrical torque is always opposite to the mechanical torque in a DC generator if you know this small concept still you can use this formula for both generator and also for the motor to get the value of the unknown current direction. So by Fleming right hand rule we can figure out the direction of current in generator and by Fleming left hand rule also we can figure out the electrical we can figure out the electrical torque due to that current produced in generator and it opposes the prime over torque. In every machine, crazy fadders law will be happening. Without this, there is no future. Always, I always tell you. See, always the cause is always going to see effect. The effect is always going to oppose the cause as per the lens. 
so always so always in a dc machine or dc in a dc machine or dc in a dc motor always whatever the effect is always going to oppose the cost this is always going to happen in the nature itself so without this there is no future so in every machine crazy fabulous law will be happening and without this there is no future always you can you can consider in any case always whatever the effect is always going to oppose the cost this is the basic principle the principle of synchronous generator is same as that the principle of dc generator as per the fabulous law the principle of synchronous generator is same as the principle of dc generator which is the fabulous law see the fabulous law is also this is the basic principle behind every generator which is the synchronous generator and also the dc generator the principle of synchronous generator is same as the principle of dc generator which is called as the fabulous law so every machine is going to basically work on the principle of the fabulous law in the dc generator actual induced voltage in the armature conductors is alternating in nature by using commutator it is converted to joule directional quantity i have already told you whatever the current and whatever the voltage inside the armature in a dc generator is always ac but outside it is a purely dc nature or joule directional quantity so inside the armature the voltage and the current are is alternating in nature but outside the commutator we can say that the voltage and the current is always u directional in nature in the dc generator actual induced voltage in the armature conductors is alternating in nature by using commutator it is converted to u directional quantity so we can say that in the dc generator actual induced voltage in the armature conductors is alternating in nature by using commutator it is converted to u directional quantity so whatever the voltage and whatever the current present in the armature conductors are always ac in nature but with the help of commutator they are going to convert into dc format so therefore simply we can say that in a dc generator actual induced voltage in the armature conductors is alternating in nature by using commutator it is converted to u directional quantity in the synchro generator actual induced voltage in the armature conductors is alternating in nature and it is directly connected at output terminals to the commutator i have already told you if you remove the commutator it is also a ac generator if you keep a commutator we are going to get a dc output similarly in the synchro generator whatever the induced voltage in the armature conductors that present on the stator it is ac in nature as you are not going to keep any commutator like that so whatever the output is basically ac in nature in the synchronous generator actual induced voltage in the armature conductors which are placed on the stator is alternating in nature and it is directly connected at the output terminal without any commutator so therefore in the synchronous generator actual induced voltage in the armature conductors is alternating in nature and it is directly connected at the output terminal without any commutator so in the synchronous generator the actual induced voltage in the armature conductors is alternating in nature and it is directly connected at the output terminals without any commutator so in the synchronous generator actual induced voltage in the armature conductors is alternating in nature and it is directly connected at the output terminals without any commutator in the synchronous generator direction of induced emf is obtained by using fleming fleming right hand rule thumb is nothing but direction of the motion of the prime mover torque and four finger is going to tell you about direction of the flux and middle finger is going to show you the direction of the induced voltage or the induced current i have already told you fleming right hand rule it should, it, should, it should be always used for the generator whether it is a dc generator or whether it is a synchronous generator so in the synchronous generator direction of induced emf or current is obtained by using fleming right hand rule the thumb is going to show you the direction of the motion which is basically the prime mover torque or mechanical torque and fourth finger is going to show you the direction of the flux and middle finger is going to show you the direction of the induced voltage or the induced current see we have to use the fleming right hand rule both for dc generator and also for the synchronous generator but whatever the thumb it is basically prime mover torque and the fourth finger is direction of the flux and middle finger is basically the direction of the induced voltage or the induced current so therefore in the synchronous generator direction of induced emf or the induced current is obtained by using the fleming right hand rule thumb is going to show you the direction of the motion which is basically prime mover torque and fourth finger is going to show you direction of the flux and middle finger is going to show you the direction of the induced voltage or direction of the induced current to convert the energy from one form to other form always opposition is required in the generator with respect to motor action electromagnetic torque is developed 
when the electromagnetic torque opposes the primo torque, energy is converted from mechanical to electrical. See, always the effect is always opposed. The effect will always oppose the cause. See, if in the case of generator, in the case of in the case of generator, always electrical torque will always oppose the mechanical torque. So always the electrical torque is always going to oppose the mechanical torque. So therefore, to convert the energy from one form to other form, always the opposition is always required. In the generator, with respect to motor action, electromagnetic torque is developed. When the electromagnetic torque opposes the prime mover torque, energy is converted from the mechanical to electrical. I already told you, in a basic generator, see, we are going to rotate the rotor with the help of mechanical torque. So because of the motor action, as there is a current, there is also a magnetic field. So whenever there is a current, there is a magnetic field. Basically, the electrical torque is going to get produced as per the motor action. So this electrical torque will be always opposite to the mechanical torque. So therefore, always energy is counted from mechanical to electrical because of this opposition only. So always, if you want to do something very good work, always there will be opposition. So you don't have to be worried in your daily life also. If, if you want to do something good, Definitely you are going to face the opposition. It is necessary, then only you can move forward in the life also. So therefore, to convert the energy from one form to other form, always opposition is required. In the generator, with respect to motor action, electromagnetic torque is developed. When the electromagnetic torque opposes the prime mover torque, energy is counted from the mechanical to electrical. So to convert the energy from one form to other form, always opposition is required. In the generator, with respect to motor action, electromagnetic torque is developed. When the electromagnetic torque opposes the prime mover torque, energy is counted from mechanical to electrical. The direction of the electromagnetic torque is given by the Fleming left hand rule. I already told you here basically the, the direction of the electromagnetic torque or we can say electrical torque is basically given by the Fleming left hand rule. So this is a very important point. These things I already told you in the class also. See, for generator, whether it is a DC generator or DC AC generator, we have to use the flaming right hand rule. And for DC motor or AC motor, we have to use the flaming left hand rule. See, always in a flaming, uh, in a DC generator or AC generator, the thumb is always going to show you the direction of the, direction of the mechanical torque. And the fourth finger is going to show you the direction of the flux. And the middle finger is going to show you the direction of the induced voltage or induced current. Whereas the Fleming, le Fleming left hand rule, it is going to show you whatever the thumb is going to show you the electrical turn. And also, whatever the four finger is going to show you the direction of the flux, and middle finger is going to show you the direction of the induced voltage or induced current. So this is the thing that you always have to keep in your mind. So, so we can say that in the generator, the mechanical torque and electrical torque are always opposite of each other. So in the generator, you can use the flaming left hand rule also. But here, the thumb is going to show you that the direction of the electrical torque or electromagnetic torque is always opposite to the mechanical torque. And one more important thing is here, F cap is called I cap plus B cap. I already told you this important relation. This F cap is nothing but electrical torque. It is always the electrical torque or electrical force is equal to I cap plus B cap. So with the help of this also you can get, you can use for both motor or generator, you can get this one. But the only thing that you have to remember, your F is nothing but always the electrical torque. It is always the electrical torque. In case of this generator, whatever this electrical torque is always opposite to the mechanical torque. So in the case of left hand rule, in the case of Fleming left hand rule, the thumb finger is going to show the direction of the force which is always electromagnetic torque. And four finger is going to show you the direction of the flux, and middle finger is going to show you the direction of the current. So therefore, the flaming layer, the flaming layer, the flaming left hand rule is basically going to tell you the thumb finger is nothing but direction of the force and electromagnetic torque, and four finger is going to show you the, the direction of the flux, and middle finger is going to show you the direction of the current. Concentric winding is used in the field winding of DC machine. So concentric winding is used in the field winding of DC machine, primary and secondary winding of transformer and field winding of the 7 pole alternator. I already told you concentric winding. So concentric winding is basically used in the field winding of DC machine, primary and secondary windings of transformer and field winding of the 7 pole alternator. So whatever the winding that you are going to use in the field winding of DC machine and the primary and secondary windings of transformer and the field winding of the silent pole alternator is always a concentric winding. So concentric winding is used in the field winding of DC machine, primary and secondary windings of transformer and the field winding of silent pole alternator. And distributed winding is used in the armature winding of DC machines and synchronous machines and field winding of cylindrical pole alternator. So because of this winding, higher order harmonics are eliminated 
by this crazy distribution method. So therefore, simply we can say that distributed winding is basically used in the armature winding of DC machines and synchronous machines. Uh, and the, the armature windings, so the distributed, wind, the distributed winding is basically used in the armature winding of DC machines and also in the synchronous machines and the field winding of the cylindrical pole alternator. So because of this winding, higher order armaments are eliminated by this crazy distributed winding. I already told you with the help with the help of this method, we can remove the higher order harmonics also I already told you with the help of this distributed winding. So we can say distributed winding is basically used in the armature winding of the DC machine and also the armature winding of the synchronous machine and the field winding of the cylindrical pole alternator. So because of this winding only higher order harmonics are eliminated by this crazy distributed winding. So therefore Distributed winding is basically used in the armature winding of DC machines and armature winding of synchronous machines and the field winding of cylindrical pole alternator. So because of this winding, higher order harmonics are eliminated by this crazy distributed winding. The advantages of the short pitch winding are dominant harmonics are eliminated, that is the fifth and seventh harmonics. I already told you, with the help of short pitch winding, we can eliminate the, the most dominant harmonics, which are the fifth and seventh harmonics. The advantage of the short pitch winding are dominant harmonics are being eliminated that is basically fifth and the seventh harmonics. So therefore simply we can say that the advantage of the short the advantage of the short pitch winding are basically we can remove the dominant harmonics are eliminated like fifth and the seventh harmonics. Short pitch winding means whenever the coil span is less than full pitch, the pole pitch is said to be a short pitch winding. So this so, so simply we can say that the advantage of the short pitch windings are dominant harmonics are eliminated that is the fifth and the seventh harmonics so the most advantages of the short pitch windings are dominant harmonics are eliminated that is basically fifth and the seventh harmonics the most advantages of the short pitch winding are dominant harmonics like fifth and seventh are being eliminated advantages of the fractional slot windings are the slot harmonics are eliminated these are used in synchronous to get sizable output voltage the advantage of the fractional slot windings are the slot harmonics are eliminated. These are used in synchronous to get the sizable output voltage. So if you go for the fractional slot winding, so fractional slot winding means I already told you here whenever M is equal to slots per pole per phase. So M is equal to slots per pole per phase. If it is not an integer, then definitely we can say that it is said to be fractional slot winding and then we are going to use the short pitch winding then we are going to use the short pitch winding so when you know, this is the case we can remove the harmonics whatever the harmonics that we want and whatever the output we are going to get a few sensible because only we are going to keep the fundamental and remaining harmonics we can eliminate so therefore we can say it is said to be a very output we are going to get a pure sign signal we form. So therefore the advantage of fractional slot windings are the slot harmonics are eliminated and these are used in the synchronous to get the size of the output voltage. I already told you fractional slot winding means m is equal to slots for pole per phase. But now this m value is not an integer. Simply we can say that here we are going to use the fractional slot winding which is basically the short pitch winding. So by this we can eliminate the harmonics whatever the thing that we want. So we are going to left with only fundamental and output will be purely sinusoidal. In DC machines we go for full pitch winding because harmonics are desirable there but not in synchronous machine. I already told you here in DC machines we go for the full pitch winding but in case of synchronous machines we go for the short pitch winding because in DC machines full pitch winding is used so therefore all the harmonics are going to get present so if we add all the harmonics in the up in the past we can see in the because all are going to have the harmonics in the if you see the positive axis like positive all harmonics are going to present if you add all the harmonics finally you are going to get a constant signal constant signal simply we can say all these harmonics are fully rectified so if you add all these harmonics you are going to get a constant signal whereas whereas in the case of simple in the case of simple generator we have to keep only the fundamental and we have to remove all the harmonics if you remove all the harmonics, we are going to lift, lift with only fundamental, then definitely we can say what are the output voltages purely sinusoidal. So this is the basic agenda by using the short pitch winding. So therefore simply we can say that in DC machines we go for the full pitch winding and in case of synchronous generator we go for the, the short pitch winding. So in DC machines we go for the full pitch winding. So therefore, because there are 
hormone is not desirable in that case. But in case of synchronous machine, we go for the short pitch winding because we don't want harmonics. So in easy machines, we go for the full pitch winding because there harmonics are necessary or desirable. But in case of synchronous machine, harmonics are unnecessary. So we go for the short pitch winding. In three phase, for full pitch winding, we get phase speed is equal to 60 dB. So in three phase, so in three phase for full pitch winding we get phase spread is equal to 60 degree so 60 degree is also called as the 60 degree is also called as the narrow widespread i have already told this important point so in three phase for full pitch winding we are going to get a phase spread is equal to 60 degree three phase for full pitch winding we are going to get a phase spread is nothing but 60 degree so therefore in three phase for full pitch winding we are going to get a phase spread is equal to 60 degree in three phase for full pitch winding, we are going to get a phase spread of 60 degree. So 60 degree is also called as the narrow wide spread. And you can say narrow, so narrow phase spread. And one degree is called as the wide phase spread. So in the three phase for a full pitch winding, we are going to get phase spread is equal to 60 degree. In double layer winding, the number of calls is equal to number of slots. I have already told you, in double layer winding, always number of calls is equal to number of slots. Let me take a small example. Let me ask if the number of calls is equal to 30 then definitely each coil will have two coil sides so 30 coil space 60 coil sides so in a double layer winding two coil sides are placed in one slot so we have 60 coil sides so two coil sides in one slot so 60 coil sides in 30 slots so therefore we can see now we have 30 coil sides 30 slots so therefore we can see the number of coils is called number of slots in case of the double layer winding see based on order construction alternates are classified as seven pole alternator or hydro alternator, cylindrical pole alternator or non-silent pole alternator or wound rotor or turbo alternator. So I already told you, based on the rotors, alternators are classified into two types. One is called as the silent pole alternators or hydro alternators because it is used in the hydro power stations. Whereas the cylindrical pole alternators or it is also called as the non-silent pole alternator or wound rotor alternator or turbo alternator because it is used in the thermal power station and the nuclear power station. When a silent pole is used in the hydro power station, when a cylindrical pole alternator is used in the thermal and the nuclear power station. So based on the rotor construction, alternators are classified into two types. One is called as the silent pole alternator, it is also called as a hydro alternator because it is used in the hydro power stations. When a cylindrical pole alternator, it is also called as the not silent pole alternator or wound rotor alternator or turbo alternator because it is used in the thermal power station and the nuclear power station. CKW is a product of the pitch factor and the distribution factor. I already told you KW is a product of the pitch factor and also the distribution factor. See KW is equal to 1 when we are dealing with conductor. This, see KW is equal to 1 basically when we are going to deal with the conductor. And KP it comes when we are doing calculations for one coil only. Whereas KD, so KD is called a distortion factor or some distribution factor. It comes whenever we are doing calculations for phase only, group of coils. So one coil means KP, then KW is equal to 1 whenever we are dealing with connector. KP is going to come into calculation and only whenever we are going to choose only one coil. And KD is going to come if you go for the phase or we can say group of coils. So KW is equal to KP into KD, KW is called as a winding factor. And KD is called as a distribution uh, pitch factor and KD is called as a distribution factor. So KW is equal to 1 whenever we are dealing with conductor. And uh, KP is equal to it comes it comes whenever we are doing doing calculations for only one coil only. And KD is nothing but it comes whenever we are doing calculations for phase only. Phase means a group of coils. So therefore simply KW is equal to KP into KD. KW is called as a winding factor and KB is called as a pitch factor and KD is called as a distribution factor. So therefore simply we can say KW is equal to 1 whenever we are dealing with only one connector and KB is something where it is going to come, it comes whenever we are doing calculations for one coil only and KD is nothing but it comes whenever we are doing calculations for phase only means a group of coils. So KW is called KP and KD, KW is called as a winding factor and KB is called as a pitch factor and KD is called as a distribution factor. So KW is equal to 1 whenever we are, doing, whenever we are dealing with conductor and K, KP is nothing but it, it comes whenever we are doing, doing calculations for one coil only and KD is called as the it comes whenever we are doing calculations for one phase only in this group of coils. So this is the, the general expression for electromagnetic torque for all rotating machines is electrical torque is equal to minus P by 2 into mu naught pi RL by G into Fm into Fa into 
sin delta fn is equal see p is equal as a total number of poles so p is equal as a total number of poles and unit is equal to 4 point 10 power of minus 7 hundred per meter and r is the radius of the rotor and length l is equal as length of the rotor and g is equal as the length of air gap and fm is equal as the nmf of the main field and f is equal as the nmf of the armature field and delta is a load angle between the fm and the fa so delta means it is a load angle it is a phase angle between the fm and fa it is also called a torque angular load angular power angle so electrical torque is equal to minus p by 2 into mu naught into pi r l by g into fm into fa into sin delta where p is called the total number of poles and mu naught is equal to 4 point 10 to the power of minus 7 and per meter and r is the radius of the rotor l is the length of the rotor and g is the length of the air gap and fm is called as the nmf of the main field and fa is called as the nmf of the armature field and delta is called as the load angle it is a phase angle between the fm and the fa so this is the general expression of the electromagnetic torque of the rotating machines is equal to minus v by 2 into mu naught pi l by g into fm into fa into sin delta so P is power total number of poles and mu is equal to 4 pole 10 to the power of minus 7 and a per meter. R is the radius of the rotor and L is equal to length of the rotor. G is the length of the air gap. Fm is called as the NMF of the main field. F is called as the NMF of the armature field. And delta is called as load angle. It is the phase angle between the Fm and the Fa. The factors affecting the terminal voltage of alternator are the armature resistance RA, leakage reactance XL and the armature reaction which is called as the XA. Here you have to write the armature reaction. Reactance is basically XA. The factors affecting the terminal voltage of alternator are the armature resistance RA, leakage reactance XL and the armature reaction reaction which is XA. I have already told you the summation of XA plus XL is called as the synchronous reactance. So therefore in case of generator EF is equal to V plus IA into RA plus J into IA into XL. Here we have to choose even the XA but now I have negative the XA value. So what is the value of V? V is equal to EF minus IA into RA plus J XL. Here I have negative the armature reaction reactance means I am going to negative the armature reaction. So all these are the perfect values only. So whenever the as load increases, as whenever the load increases, current IA increases. So this drop is going to get increased. So the terminal voltage will decrease. So therefore simply we can say that as the load increases, current IA increases. So this drop will increase. So therefore the terminal voltage will decrease. So leakage flux are present only under the loaded condition. Leakage flux are present only under the loaded condition. Because whenever you apply a load, current IA is going to get flow. Then only we are going to get the leakage flux. So we can say that the leakage flux are present only under the loaded condition. At no load, the current IA is equal to zero. So leakage flux is also equal to zero. So therefore the terminal voltage is equal to induced EMF. But as the load is present, then the leakage flux is going to get present. So therefore the leakage flux are present only under the loaded condition. So when the alternator is loaded, effects of armature reaction on the main field flux is called as the armature reaction. Basically, this is called as the armature flux. The effect of the armature flux on the main flux, main field flux is called as the armature reaction. In the alternator, the nature of armature reaction depends upon the nature of the power factor. I have already told you, based on the load power factor, we can say what is the nature of the armature reaction. It can be sometimes magnetizing, it can be sometimes demagnetizing, sometimes it can be only cross magnetization or sometimes it can be both. So therefore simply we can say that, so whenever the alternator is loaded, the effect of the armature flux on the main field flux is called as the armature reaction. In the alternator, nature of the armature reaction depends upon the nature of the load power factor. So this is a very important point. Based on the load power factor, we can say what is the nature of the armature reaction. It can be either magnetizing, it can be either demagnetizing, it can be either cross magnetization, either it can be summation of two things. So therefore, we simply we can say that whenever the alternator is loaded, the effect of armature flux on the main field flux is called as the armature reaction. In the alternator, the nature of the armature reaction depends upon the nature of the load power factor. To analyze the armature reaction on synchronous motor, just reverse the IA in synchronous generator and then analyze it. That's it. Everything is same. So to analyze the armature reaction on synchronous motor, just reverse the IA in the synchronous generator and analyze. That's it. Suppose if you want to analyze the armature reaction on synchronous motor, 
if you know the the each and every aspect of symptom generator just to reverse the ia by 180 degree then you are going to get the analysis for the symptom of smooth up so just to go for the same analysis as case of generator just to reverse the ia by 180 degree then what are the analysis that you are going to get it is for the synchronous motor so this is a very important point see what are the graphs that you remember for symptom generator just reverse the current ia by 180 degree then just reverse the current ia then now what are the analysis that you are going to get it is for the glass motor so therefore to analyze the armature reaction of synchronous motor just reverse the ia in the synchronous generator and analyze that's it now you are going to get for the synchronous motor armature reaction drop is equal to ia into xa xa is equal as armature reaction reactants then ef is equal to b plus ia into ra plus j into ia into xa plus j into ia into xa so here ef is equal to b plus if you take ia common we are going to get ra plus j xa where xa is a combination of xa plus xa xa is equal to synchronous reactants is equal to b plus ia into gds because gds is equal to ra plus j xa and gds is equal to ra plus j xa so this is the equation the perfect equation of a synchronous generator so therefore simply we can say the armature reaction drop is equal to ia into xa and xa is equal to armature reaction reactants xa is equal to leakage reactants so therefore the perfect mf equation in case of generator is equal to ef is equal to ia plus ia into ra plus j into ia into xa plus j into ia into xa so if you do this one we are going to get ef is equal to b plus ia into ra plus j xa xa is a summation of xa plus xa b plus ia into j s so xa is xa is equal to xa plus xa xa is equal to synchronous reactants and j s is equal to ra plus j xa in synchronous motor when the rotor speed is more than synchronous speed induction generator torque is developed in the opposite direction of the rotor rotation then the rotor will decelerate to reach the synchronous speed i already told you whenever the synchronous motor speed is higher than the synchronous speed if the, if the rotor speed is higher than synchronous speed then induction generator torque is going to get developed in the opposite direction of the rotor so therefore the speed will decrease and it will reach to the synchronous speed suppose if the synchronous motor speed nr is less than ns then induction motor torque is going to get generated and it will be in the same direction of the rotor direction then the torque will increase then it the speed will increase to the synchronous speed so this is a important point that i already told you in the synchronous motor concept itself so in synchronous motor whenever the rotor speed is more than synchronous speed induction generator torque is developed in the opposite direction of the rotor rotation then the rotor will decelerate to reach the synchronous speed first lock of the skill cage induction motor are skewed slightly so as to i already told you whatever the rotor slots on the skill cage induction motor are skewed slightly because of these reasons to eliminate the locking tendency of the rotor and to reduce the noise so by using that we are going to reduce the locking tendency between the rotor and the stator and also it is going to reduce the humming noise or the noise if the skewed rotor bars flux distribution will be uniform in the air gap because of the uniform reluctance so the harmonics slot harmonics present in the air gap flux will reduce and this will result in a more uniform torque and quieter operation that is reduction in the motor humming during its operation so because of reduction in the slot harmonics clogging and clogging can also be prevented so i want to tell you see what is the basic under the basic agenda of screwing the slots the rotor slots in a induction motor so listen carefully the rotor slots of the skill cage induction motor are skewed slightly because to eliminate the locking tendency of the rotor and the shaft and also to reduce the noise so with the skewed rotor bars the flux distribution will be uniform in the air gap because of uniform reluctance of the because of the uniform reluctance the air gap is also uniform so the harmonics basically the slot harmonics present in the air gap flux will reduce and this will, will result in a more uniform torque and quieter operation that is reduction in motor humming during its operation so because of reduction in slot harmonics clogging and clogging can also be prevented i already told you all these basic reasons in the induction in the synchronous motor concepts only so basically in the in the induction motor basically in the skill cage induction motor we are going to screw the slots because whenever you screw the slots or we can we simply we can say we are going to screw the rotor bars so therefore we can say that we are going to increase the length of the connector bars and also we are going to reduce the locking tendency between the rotor and the stator and also we are going to reduce the noise also so therefore if you do the screwing 
we are going to get the flux is always purely sinusoidal or simply we can say we are going to reduce the harmonics in the fluxes. So whenever you reduce the harmonics in the fluxes, for the, the torque speed curve we are going to get a uniform curve we are going to get and then we are going to get a very quieter operation and also the causing and crawling can also be prevented because crawling means they, see causing means the locking tendency crawling means running at very slow speed this also we can remove with the help of this screwing of the rotor bars of the spherical cage induction motor so the rotor slots of the spherical cage induction motor are screwed slightly so it has to eliminate the locking tendency between the rotor and the start and also to reduce the noise. So with the skewed rotor bars, the flux distribution will be uniform in the air gap because of the uniform reluctance. So the harmonics present in the air gap flux will reduce and this will result in a more uniform torque and pointer operation, that is reduction in the motor humming during its operation. So because of reduction in slot harmonics, fogging and crawling can also be prevented. And I have already told you, the efficiency is also going to get decreased because as the rotor slot length is increases, so therefore the resistance increases, the bar resistance will increase, so therefore simply we can say that the copper loss increases, so efficiency will decrease. So these are the advantages and also the disadvantages, efficiency will decrease. So all these things I have already told you in the induction motor concepts only. So finally I am going to report this one. The rotor slot of the spill cage induction motor are screwed slightly, so as to eliminate the locking tendency of the rotor and to reduce the noise. With the skewed rotor bars, the flux distribution will be uniform in the air gap because of uniform reluctance. So the harmonics, especially the slot harmonics present in the air gap flux will reduce and this will result in a more uniform torque and pointer operation. That is, flexion in the motor humming during its operation. Because of reduction in the slot harmonics, organ crawling can also be prevented but also the efficiency is also going to get decrease. The maximum torque developed by a three-phase induction motor is independent of the rotor resistance. I have already told you the maximum torque expression is equal to 180 by 2 pi ns into e to square by 2 x2. You can see clearly this maximum torque is independent of the rotor resistance. So we can see that the maximum torque developed by a three-phase induction motor is independent of the rotor resistance. So regulation in the arbitrator is different as change in thermal voltage to rated voltage. When the full load is thrown off at a given power factor with constant speed and constant excitation. I have already told you the regulation of R in the formula which is E minus V by V into 100. So E is called as a no load voltage and V is called as a rated voltage. So there is a difference. Always E is always given the V. So therefore the regulation of R is defined as the change in terminal voltage to rated voltage. When the full load is thrown off at a given power factor with constant speed and constant excitation. So whenever you keep, whenever you remove the full load, then definitely you can say there is a rising voltage. How much amount of rising voltage that is called as the regulation. So the, the regulation in the altogether is defined as the change in terminal voltage to rated voltage when the full load is thrown off at a given power factor with constant speed and constant excitation. The regulation in the altogether is defined as the change in terminal voltage attributed to the change in terminal voltage to rated voltage when the Full load is thrown off at a given power factor with constant speed and constant excitation. So regulation in R and is defined as the change in terminal voltage to rated voltage when the full load is thrown off at a given power factor with constant speed and constant excitation. For lagging load and UPF load, regulation is always positive and for leading load, power factor regulation may be positive, negative or zero. I have already told you, for lagging load, the, the voltage regulation is always positive, but as for leading load, the regulation, the voltage regulation can be either positive, either can be negative or either it can be zero. But as for unity power factor, always the voltage regulation is always positive. These things I have already told you. And I have already told you, in the leading power factor, in the leading power factor, whenever the power factor is near to unity, we are going to get a zero power, zero power factor, zero voltage regulation. Similarly, in the lagging load, whenever the power factor is nearly, whenever the power factor is nearly close to zero, we are going to get a maximum voltage regulation. So listen carefully, I have already told you in an alternate whenever the leading power factor it is nearly equal to unity, there you are going to get a there you are going to get a zero voltage regulation or minimum voltage regulation. Whereas in the lagging load, whenever the whenever the lag at lagging load, whenever the power factor is nearly equal to zero, then we can say that at zero power factor lagging we are going to get a maximum voltage regulation. All these things I have already told you in the all the meter concepts only. So percentage of voltage regulation is in the altimeter is equal to E minus V by V into 100. 
I already told you e minus v is nothing but i a into z s by v into r a because e minus v is nothing but i a into z s by v into r a. z s is equal to see z s is equal to r plus j x s. I already told you r is a very low value, so we are going to neglect it. So the j so z s is nearly equal to j into x s. So yeah, I am going to substitute here. z s is equal to j into x s. So we are going to get j into a into x s by v into hundred. So n is equal to prime over speed. So n is equal to uh, n r is equal to n s is equal to one twenty by p. So f is equal to p into n by one twenty. So e f is equal to four point four four five f t turns t is equal to turns per phase k p into k d. So I want to draw this important point. E f is equal to EMF induced in the per phase voltage of generator. What are the EMF induced per phase in case of generator winding is equal to 4.44 phi F turns per phase into KP into KD. So EF is equal to 4.44 phi F turns per phase into KP into KD. See, whenever the speed decreases, whenever the prime over speed decreases, definitely frequency decreases. As the frequency decreases, excess value decreases. As excess decreases. Definitely, we can say as the frequency decreases, E F is also going to get decrease. As E F decreases, definitely the terminal voltage is also decreases. But the radiation is always constant because both are decreasing, so so the difference is always constant. So therefore, simply we can say it is again constant so because the numerator is decreasing and the denominator is also decreasing. So the radiation is always constant. So we can say that always we can say that that is the reason. Part of the graph that you are going to graph. Whatever the graph that you are going to draw with respect to voltage regulation is always constant. It is independent of speed. See whatever the graph that, that see whatever the graph that they have drawn with respect to voltage regulation for different power factors, you are going to get a certain graph. Whatever the graph is independent of speed. No matter whatever the speed of the arc meter, the graph is always constant. See, I already told you whatever the speed of the arc meter, whatever the speed of the prime of the arc meter. Definitely, the this graph is constant for all the speeds. Means, no matter what or the speed at which we are going to rotate the alternator, the voltage regulation graph for all speeds is always constant. Listen carefully. I already told this important point in the alternator concepts itself. Here, I have drawn the voltage regulation graph for the alternator. Then, what are the graph that I have obtained? It is independent of the speed of the prime mover of alternator. No matter whatever the speed of the prime mover of the alternator, this graph is always constant. So because you can see clearly here, whenever the prime mover speed decreases, the frequency decreases. As frequency decreases, excess decreases because excess is proportional to frequency, so excess decreases. And also whenever EF decreases, e, whenever EF decreases, EF is also decreases. As EF decreases, V also will decrease. So here basically this follows the See, as excess decreases and V is also decreasing, so both are decreasing. So therefore, the ratio is almost constant. So therefore, the percentage of regulation is constant. Or simply, we can say that the regulation graph of alternator is uh, same for diff, no matter what or the speed of the alternator. The graph is always same for each and every speed. To find the regulation of alternator, the following methods are developed. They are called as the. So I have already told you. I have shown each and everything how to find the regulation of alternator by different methods. To find the regulation of alternator, the following methods are developed. They are called as the direct method and the indirect method. But we have learned only the indirect method, which is called as the EMF method, MMF method, JPF method, and ESC method. EMF method is also called as the synchronous impedance method, and MMF method is called as the Anderton's method. And JPM is the most zero power factor method, and the last one is ASM method, which is also called as the Ampere Standard Association method. I have already told you this method is more accurate than this method, and this method is more accurate than this method, and this method is more accurate than this method. But if you want to know the basic, the numerical value which is having the highest value means this one will have the more higher value of voltage regulation. Then comes this one, then comes this one, then comes this one. So I have already told all these things in the Regulation itself, the concept of alternator. So this method is more accurate than this method, and this method is more accurate than this method, and this method is more accurate than this method. But if you want to know, in case of whatever the value that you are going to get for regulation by these different methods, this method will have more numerical value than this method. This method will have more numerical value when compared to this method, and this method will have more numerical value when compared to this method. I have already told all these things in the. Whenever we are finding the regulation of alternator by using the different methods, 
So in the force we have learned only about the indirect method, but not the direct methods. Indirect methods are called as the EMF method, MF method, ZPF method and KSF method. EMF method is also called as a synchronous inverse method. MMF method is also called as a undetermined method. And ASA method is also called as American Standard Association method. And ZPF is also called as the zero power factor method. So in the direct method of in the direct method by connecting the actual load to the alternator, low load and full load voltages are measured and regulation is calculated. This method is preferred only for low rating alternators. It is not economical for high rating alternator. In this direct method of testing, actual load to the see in the direct method of testing, connecting actual load to the alternator. So no load and full load voltages are measured and regulation is calculated. This method is preferred only for low rating alternators. It is not economical for high rating alternator. So we can say simply that I already told you in the direct method we have to actually connect the load and then we have to find what with the help of voltmeter we have to find what is the no load voltage and what is the full load voltage and based on that we have to give we have to keep these values in the formula and then we can get the value of the regulation of the alternator. This is suitable for only low rating alternators but if you go for high rating alternators it is impossible to connect the rated load so simply we can say it is not economical for high rating alternators so in a direct method by connecting the actual load to the alternator no basically no load it has to be load no load that is a no load and full load voltage are measured and regulation is calculated this method is preferred for only low rating alternators and it is, a, and it is not economical for high rating alternators for an isolated alternator, nature of power factor of the alternator depends on external load is connected. For isolated alternator, nature of the power factor of the alternator depends on external load it is connected. So we can say whatever the alternator power factor is equal to power factor of the load that you are going to connect. So therefore, for an isolated alternator, the nature of power factor of the alternator depends on the external load you are going to make correct. So therefore, we can say that. For isolated alternator, the nature of power factor of the alternator depends upon the external load power factor that you are going to correct. So therefore, simply we can say that for isolated alternator, the nature of power factor of the alternator depends upon the external load power factor that you are going to get connected. Suppose a synchronous, gen suppose a synchronous generator connected to an infrared bus is applying electrical power and unity power factor to the bus. If its field current is now increased, then the active power supplied will remain unchanged, but the machine will also supply lagging reactive power. See, suppose a synchronous generator connected to an infrared bus is supplying electrical power at unity power factor to the bus. If its field current is now increased, then the active power supplied will remain unchanged, but the machine will also supply lagging reactive power. See, I already told you one important point that you always have to remember. At the normal excitation, at the normal excitation, I have already told you here, at the, at the normal excitation, the generator will have a unity power factor, then it can deliver the active power, but it will neither absorb or neither deliver the reactive power. So whenever you increase the field current, then definitely, whenever you increase the field current, you can say that that synchronous generator is now going into over excitation state. Over excitation state means the H pause delta is greater than B. Then we can say that whenever in the over excitation state, simply we can say that the energy current increases and the power factor is lagging for a synchronous generator. So lagging power factor. So it see the field current, the excitation can only change the EF value, but it will never change the power because only the steam input, if you increase the mechanical input, then only you can change the or active power output but here we are changing only the excitation so only excitation can only change the EF value or IA value or power factor but it can't change the value of the active power output listen carefully excitation can change either the IA value either the power factor or either you can change the nature of the load nature of the synchronous generator either it can be lagging reading or anything it can change but it will never change the amount of power output to the generator. So listen carefully, the excitation can only change the value of armature current IA or the power factor of generator or it can change the lagging or reading of the generator but it will never change the active power because only the 
if you give more economy, more eco more mechanical input, then only the active power output will, will change. So therefore, the active power output will be same as the previous one. But I already told you, this is the over excitation state. So over excitation state means the armature current will increase and the power factor is lagging and is decreasing also. And in the over excitation state, it is always going to deliver the reactive power. See, but I already told you, is it is operating in the lagging region. So therefore, it is going to supply the lagging reactive power. So therefore, this is the concept that you always have to understand. I have already told you all these concepts in the synchronous machine concepts only. This is just a revision of some of the important points of the each and every topic in the electrical machines. For the silent pole alternator, XD is calculated by connecting the following test, OC test, AC test, RE test. For the silent pole alternator, XD is calculated by connecting the following test, which are called as the OC test, AC test and the RE test. And you can simply call the DC test. So therefore, for a silent pole alternator, XD, XD is called as a direct access reactance is calculated by connecting the following test, which are the OC test, AC test and the DC test or RE test. For the silent pole alternator, XD is calculated by connecting the following test, which are called as a slip test maximum lagging current test and the reluctance motor test. So this is a very important one that you always have to remember these things. So therefore, for the silent pole alternator, the direct access reactor is calculated by connecting the following test, which are the OC test, SC test and the RE test. For the silent pole alternator, the quadrature access reactors, XQ, is calculated by connecting the following test, which are the slip test, maximum lagging current test and the reluctance motor test. If nothing specified, then they are asking, Three-phase power. See, if nothing is specified, then they are basically asking the three-phase power. Suppose in the question, if they are not specified anything regarding the power, it means that basically by default they are asking the three-phase power. Suppose in the question, if they are not specified anything regarding the power, then definitely by default they are asking about the three-phase power. Suppose if in the question, if they are not specified anything, then basically they are asking about the three-phase power. So in the question if they are not specified, in the question if, if suppose if in the question if they are not specified anything regarding the power, then by default they are asking about the three phase power. When the synchronous motor is subjected to sudden variation of the load, the rotor is going to oscillate in the forward and the backward direction and it will hunt for a stable point. This phenomenon is called as the hunting. During hunting, there is a phase displacement between the V and EF continuously changes. Thereby this phenomenon is also called as the phase swinging. So basically when the synchronous motor is subjected to sudden variation of the load, the rotor is going to oscillate in the forward and the backward direction and it will hunt for the new stable point. This phenomenon is called as the hunting. During hunting, there is a phase displacement across the V and EF conditions changes, thereby this phenomenon is also called as a phase swinging. So basically, whenever you suddenly change the load on the synchronous motor, then definitely the rotor is always going to oscillate in the forward and the backward direction and it will, it will basically hunt for a stable point. This is called as the hunting. So during hunting, always the phase, dis there is a phase displacement, or we can say the phase, what are the phase angle between the V and EF? V and EF is nothing but delta. It is a, delta is angle between the V and EF. It is going to continuously changes. Thereby, this formula is also called as a phase swinging. So we can also call it as a hunting or phase swinging. So therefore, whenever the synchronous motor is subjected to sudden variation of the load, the rotor is going to oscillate in the forward and the backward direction and it will hunt for a new stable point. This phenomenon is called as the hunting. So during hunting, the phase displacement, which is the phase angle between the V and F is nothing but delta, it is always going to continuously change us, thereby this phenomenon is also called as the phase swinging. So whenever the synchronous motor is subjected to sudden variation of the load, the rotor is going to oscillate in the forward and the backward direction and it will hunt for the new stable point. This phenomenon is called as the hunting. So during hunting, there is a phase displacement, which is the, the phase during hunting, the phase displacement V and EF continuously changes, means delta is the angle between V and EF, it is going to continuously changes, thereby this phenomenon is also called as the phase swinging. A silent pole synchronous motor is running with normal excitation. If the excitation is reduced to zero, then it becomes a synchronous reluctance motor. So listen carefully here. A silent pole synchronous motor is running with normal excitation. If the excitation is reduced to zero, then it is going to become like a synchronous reluctance motor. I have already told you, in a, in a reluctance motor, 
you don't need any field excitation. This point I have already told you in the reluctance smoother concepts itself. So therefore, here whenever you make the excitation is equal to zero, it is called as the synchronous reluctance motor. So whenever you make IF is equal to zero, it is said to be synchronous reluctance motor. So therefore, whenever you make the field ground is equal to zero or completely if you remove the field excitation, it is, it is said to be a synchronous reluctance motor. So this is a very important point that you always have to understand. So therefore, a silent port synchronous motor is running with normal excitation. If the excitation is reduced to zero, then it is going to become like a synchronous electrons motor. The following reasons for providing the damping bars on the whole phases of a synchronous motor, they are basically starting the motor as a swell gauge induction motor to reduce the tendency of oscillation of the rotor with load changes. Only induction torque exists at the start but not at landing conditions of the synchronous motor. See, I have already told you the basic function, the basic function of damping bars in a synchronous motor. They are going to provide the starting torque and also they are going to reduce the oscillations of the rotor whenever the load changes. And also, basically, initially, whatever torque that you are going to get is called the induction torque. As synchronous, at the, whenever the NR is equal to NS, there is no induction torque because at starting, NR is always less than NS, then induction torque is going to get exist. But at running conditions, when the NR is equal to NS, there is no, there is nothing like basically induction torque because at that time, NR is equal to NS, so induction torque is equal to zero. So we can say the basic reason for providing the damper bars, damping bars in a synchronous motor is to provide the starting torque and also to reduce the oscillations of the rotor whenever the load is going to get changed. All these things I have already told you. So whenever the load is decreased, the NR is greater than NS. So therefore, at the time, induction generator torque is going to get added in the auto direction of the rotor. So NR will be decreased to NS. Similarly, if the load is increased suddenly, then NR is less than NS, then induction motor torque is going to get added in the same direction of the rotor and then the rotor speed will increase to the NS. All these things I have already told you. So therefore, the following reasons for providing the damper bars on the pole phases of a synchronous motor, basically. See, pole phases means on the field winding, the poles, on the poles we are going to basically keep the damping bars. So the, the following reasons for providing the damper bars on the damping bars on the poles phases of a synchronous motor, they are starting the motor as a square gauge induction motor because at the starting, NR is less than NS, so it is going to act like an induction motor to reduce the tendency of oscillation of the motor with load changes. And only induction torque exists at the start, but not at the running condition of synchronous motor. All these things are only truly just now. The following will change in a synchronous motor as a consequence of excitation variations there. The following will change in a synchronous motor as a consequence of excitation variations there. Full out torque or the maximum torque changes, torque angle changes and the magnitude and the power factor of the standard current changes. I have already told you with the variation of the with the variation of the excitations, we can change the armature current, we can change the power factor and also we can change the nature of the power factor also and we can say that we can also change the torque angle torque angle means delta between the ef and v also we can change and the maximum torque also we can change so all these things we can change by varying the excitations the following will change in a synchronous motor as a consequence of the excitation variations they are basically pull out or pull out torque or the maximum torque is going to get changes and the torque angle means delta delta is the phase angle between the ef and v these things are also going to get changes and similarly, the magnitude and the power factor of the shutter current changes. So, what is the shutter current means armature current. These things are also going to get changes and the power factor means the nature of the power factor also going to get changes. All these things I have already told you. See, if either for a synchronous motor or synchronous generator, the power factor is always stable with respect to V and IA. I have already told this important point. So, therefore, the following will change in a synchronous motor as a consequence of excitation variations. They are basically full of torque or the maximum torque and the torque angle means delta. It is a phase angle between the EF and V. The volume will change in a synchronous motor as a consequence of excitation variations. They are basically pull out torque or the maximum torque changes. Torque angle changes means delta. It is a phase angle between the EF and V. It is also going to get changes. And the magnitude and the power factor. Power factor means it is a theta which is a phase fit. Power factor is nothing but theta which is a phase angle between the EF and the V. It is also going to get changes. The reason power factor means it is a phase angle between the it is a, it is a theta is equal to phase angle between the V and IA, V and IA. And also the standard current is armature current. So power factor means theta which is a phase angle between the V and IA. So power factor means it is a phase angle between the 
PA and IA and the shutter current means armature current. All these things are going to get changes. And the output power remains constant. I have already told you, excitation can only change these things but not the power because only mechanical input can only change the only mechanical input can only change the output power. So therefore, as you are wearing excitation, so output power will always remain constant because excitation can't change the output power. Only the mechanical input power can only change the output power. So as a as they are not mentioned anything regarding the variations of the mechanical input, so we can assume that it's a constant. So therefore the output power is also constant. So finally we can say that the if you if you change the excitation of a synchronous motor, we are going to change the Pull out torque of the maximum torque changes and the torque angle changes with the phase angle. Delta is equal to phase angle between the EF and V and the magnitude and the power factor of the shutter current changes. Means we are going to change the magnitude and the power factor. It is a theta is equal to angle between the V and IA. V and IA. And also shutter current means armature current. All these things we are going to change but not the output power. Output power is always remains constant. Proper synchronization of a large synchronous machine to a bus. The frequency of the incoming machine should be slightly higher than that of the bus. So very important point. For proper synchronization of a large synchronous machine to a bus, the frequency of the incoming machine should be slightly higher than that of the bus. So always, I have already told you, whenever two synchronous machines, if you want to connect in parallel, they should have same voltage, they should have same frequency, and uh, both the dot polarity should be connected. Same polarities are, are should be connected. Uh, should, should be connected and irrespective of the ratings of the machines. So listen carefully. If you want to connect the two synchronous machines in synchronism or parallel, definitely they should have the same voltage ratings. They should have the same frequency of operation. And definitely the dotted the, the same polar terminals are being connected. And also we can say that they irrespective of the ratings of the alternator they can connect. So these are the things I have already told you. For proper for a proper synchronization of a large synchronous machine to a bus, the frequency of the incoming machine should be slightly higher, higher than that of the bus. So for proper synchronization of a large synchronous machine to a bus, the frequency of the incoming machine should be slightly higher than that of the bus. So whatever the synchronous machine that you want to connect to the bus, then that synchronous machine should have frequency somewhat higher than the bus frequency. So therefore, for proper synchronization of a large synchronous machine to a bus, the frequency of the incoming machine should be slightly higher than that of the bus. So for proper synchronization of a large synchronous machine to a bus, the frequency of the incoming machine should be slightly higher than that of the bus. So for proper synchronization of a large synchronous machine to a bus, the frequency of the incoming machine should be slightly higher than that of the bus. For an alternator, if the power input from the prime work is gradually decreased and finally stopped, then it will act as a synchronous motor with IA is equal to opposite than the previous and EF lacks V. So listen carefully, for an alternator, if the power input from the primer is gradually decreased and finally stopped, then it is going to act like a synchronous motor with IA is equal to opposite than, than the previous one and EF is going to lack the V. I have already told you, in a synchronous generator, EF is always going to lead the V. Whereas in the case of synchronous motor, always EF is always going to lag the V. These things I have already told you. See, in the case of synchronous generator, EF is always going to lead the V. Whereas in case of synchronous motor, always EF is always going to lag the V. These things I have already told you in case of the synchronous motor and synchronous generator. So whenever if you are, if you are starting the mechanical input to a synchronous motor, then definitely it is going to behave like a synchronous motor. So whenever you start the input to a synchronous generator, it will act like a synchronous motor. So the direction of the IA will be reversed. Then the EF, now EF is going to lag the V because the generator always, EF is always going to lead the V. But now in case of motor, EF is going to lag the V. So these things I have already told you in a very legal manner. So therefore, for an alternator, the power input from the primary has to decrease and finally stop then it is going to act like a synchronous motor with IA is equal to opposite than the previous one and EF is going to lag the V. The field winding of a previous synchronous motor is short-circuited directly. The field winding of a previous synchronous motor is short-circuited directly. If a previous balanced voltage is impressed across the stator terminals, then the rotor will rotate with slightly less than the synchronous speed and it behaves like a speed gauge induction motor. So listen carefully here. If the field winding of a three-phase synchronous motor is short-circuited directly, if a three-phase balanced voltage is impressed across the shutter terminals, then the rotor will rotate with slightly less than the synchronous speed. I have already told you, whenever the 
field winding of a three phase synchronized motor is short circuit directly. If a three phase balanced voltage is impressed across the stator terminals, then the rotor is going to rotate with a slightly less than the signal of speed and is going to behave like a field gauge induction motor. This is I already told you in a very detailed manner. So whenever you are going to short circuit the field winding on the rotor and if you give a three phase AC supply to the stator, definitely we are going to get an RMF correcting magnetic field and because of this, this is the currents are going to induce in the field winding and then it is going to rotate in the direction of the RMF because by with the help of the lens law. So therefore it is always going to rotate at a speed lesser than the synchronous speed. This is going to be an induction motor, a speed gauge induction motor. Ancient alternators are designed for large air gap to have armature reaction decreases. So excess decreases. So therefore the percentage of Radius will decrease because it is anti proportional to ZS. Very stable parallel operation, higher stability limit, and sensible MMF distribution. So, ancient ordinators, ancient ordinators are designed for large air gap. So, they basically have the large amount of air gap to have armature reaction decreases. So, therefore, simply we can say that the excess decreases. So, therefore, as excess, de excess decreases, ZS decreases. But the Voltage regulation is added proportional to ZS. So it is also going to get decrease. So very stable very stable parallel operation and higher stability limit, higher stability limit and the sensible MMF distribution is possible in case of the ancient alternators. So in case of ancient alternators, ancient alternators are designed for the large air gap to have the armature reaction decreases, so excess decreases. So we can say the percentage of voltage regulation is very proportional to this. It is also decreases. So they have the very stable parallel operation, higher stability limit, higher stability limit, and the sensible MMF distribution. When the rotor speed in a synchronous machine becomes more than the synchronous speed during hunting, the damper bar that develops the index generator torque opposite to the rotor, opposite to the rotor rotation in order to make it as a synchronous speed. I already told you this important point. See whenever the during hunting, suppose if you suddenly decrease the load, then definitely the NR will be given down NS. At that time, the induction generator torque is going to get generated to the opposite direction of the rotor, rotor rotation and the rotor is going to get distributed and finally it is going to become synchronous speed. All these things I only told you. So therefore, when the rotor speed in a, when the rotor speed in a synchronous machine becomes more than a synchronous speed during hunting, the damper bars develop the induction generator torque is quite opposite to the rotation of the rotor in order to make it as a synchronous speed. So, slip test is used to figure out the direct and the quadrature axis synchronous reactance of silent bolt synchronous machine. So, slip test is used to figure out the direct and the quadrature axis synchronous reactance of silent bolt synchronous machine. So, with the help of the slip test, we can figure out the, the XD and the XQ of a silent bolt synchronous machine. XD is called as a direct axis synchronous reactance and XD, X, XD and X is x is called as synchronous reactance. So, we listen carefully. See, xz and xq. xz is called as direct axis reactance and xq is called as the quadrature axis reactance. So, with the help of slip test, we can figure out the value of the xz and xq of a silent pole synchronous machine. Only for the silent pole synchronous machine only we are going to get the xz and xq. So, therefore, the slip test is basically used to figure out the direct and the quadrature axis synchronous reactance of a silent pole synchronous machine. Open circuit and the Zero power factor test is done to determine the is done to determination of synchronous ODR reactance of synchronous machine. Open circuit and the ZPF test is done to determine to for the determination of the synchronous ODR reactance of synchronous machine. I already told you in the synchronous machine concepts only in the case of ASA method and the ZPF method. So we have to know the two graphs. One is called as OCC graph and the other is called as the ZPF graph. So with the help of, with the help of these two graphs, we can we can draw the the Fourier triangle. So then we can get the Fourier reactant. So therefore, whatever that height, the whatever the height, the perpendicular height, it is called as the Fourier reactance graph. So from there, from that we can get the Fourier reactance also. So therefore, open circuit test and the zero power factor test is done to is done for determination of the synchronous Fourier reactance of synchronous machine because I have already told you there you have to draw the OCC graph and also the ZPF graph. So with the help of these two graphs we can get the Fourier triangle. In the Fourier triangle the perpendicular height, the perpendicular height is nothing but this cause the, the Fourier reactance drop. So from that we can get the Fourier reactance also. So open circuit test and the zero power factor test is done for the 
determination of the synthesis for the reactants of synthesis machine. Synthesis test is done to determine the efficiency and the regulation of transformer. I have already told you the synthesis test is basically is done to figure out the efficiency and the regulation of the transformer. How much it can regulate the huge amount of temperature. For how much maximum temperature rise we can easily figure out with the help of this synthesis test. So with the help of synthesis test, we can figure out the OC test, we can figure out the, we can, we can find the AC test, we can find the OC test and also we can find the, the maximum temperature rise also we can figure out. So simply we can say that with the help of synthesis test, we can find that we can use to figure out the efficiency and also the regulation of the transformer. Because if you know all the losses and the maximum temperature rise, we can also find the efficiency and also the regulation of the transformer. CMOS test is done to determination of constant losses of a DC shunt machine because CMOS test is basically no other test. It is used for finding the constant losses. So it is basically indirect test. So if you know the constant loss, we can find the efficiency at any particular load. Only for DC shunt machine and a DC compound machine. It is not suitable for the DC series method because it is a no load test. So this series cannot be operated at the no load. So therefore, for DC series mode, this, this, this test is invalid. So if you want to find the efficiency of the DC machine, this series machine, then you have to find, then you have to use the field test. I have already told you, the electrical power is equal to maximum power into sine delta. So electrical power is equal to maximum power into sine delta, it is a general expression. So synchronizing power coefficient means it is a, you have to do the differentiation of P with respect to delta. So therefore, if you do the IO equation with respect to differentiation with respect to delta, we are going to get the synchronizing power coefficient is equal to PM into cos delta. So synchronizing power coefficient is equal to DP by DE delta is equal to PM into cos delta. In a synchronous machine, active power controlled by varying only mechanical input and the reactive power controlled by varying only excitation. So this is a very important concept that you always have to remember. In a synchronous machine, active power controlled is only by the mechanical input. So by varying the mechanical input, we can vary the amount of active power output from a synchronous machine. Similarly, with the help of excitation, we can control the amount of reactive power. So these things that you always have to remember. So by by varying, so by varying the mechanical input, we can vary the active power output from a synchronous machine. Similarly, by varying the excitation, we can we can vary the amount of reactive power. Reactive power, the synchronous machine can absorb the reactive power, it can deliver the reactive power, or it may not absorb or deliver the reactive power. All these three things can be done by the synchronous machine itself. If a induction motor has self-starting, synchronous motor is not self-starting, whereas DC this series motor has high starting torque and this is a shunt motor has adjustable speed. I have already told you all these things. See, three phase induction motor has a self starting property, whereas single phase induction motor is not a self starting. Similarly, synchronous motor is not self starting. Whether it is a three phase or single phase, it is always non self starting. Listen carefully. Single phase and the three phase synchronous motors are always non self starting. Similarly, DC series motor has the high starting torque. I have already told you. DC series motor has the highest starting torque when compared to any other motor and the DC motors have the excellent speed control characteristics when compared to any other motor. I have already told this important point. And DC shunt motor has the adjustable speed. If the load requirement of a synchronous motor exceeds the pull out torque, maximum torque, then the synchronous motor action is lost because rotor and the shutter fins are no longer stationary with respect to each other means no magnetic locking. So, so listen carefully. If the load requirement of a synchronous motor exceeds the pull, pull out torque or maximum torque, then the synchronous motor action is lost because rotor and the shutter fins are no longer stationary with respect to each other. That means no magnetic locking. So listen carefully. I have already told you if the if the load that you are going to keep either on the induction motor or the synchronous motor, if it is very higher than the maximum torque produced by the induction motor, synchronous motor, then definitely it will never rotate. So always part of the load demand should lie it should be always lesser than the maximum torque developed by the induction motor or synchronous motor. Then only it can rotate, otherwise it cannot rotate. So this is a very important point that you always have to understand. So whatever the load demand torque should be always lesser than the maximum torque produced by the electrical by that electrical machine. Then only the load can rotate. Otherwise it will never rotate. If the load requirement of a synchronous motor exceeds the load torque or the maximum torque, then the synchronous motor action is lost because the rotor and the stator fields are no longer stationary with respect to each other. That means no magnetic locking. So from slip test on a silent pole machine, I have already told you, with the help of slip test on a silent pole machine, we can find the value of the XD and XQ. XD is called as the direct axis reactance and, X, and uh, XQ is called as the quadrature axis reactance. I have already told you, in a ABCD, in, in the 
in the english alphabet d is always going to come earlier than the q value so therefore always x is always greater than x q so the axis is nothing but it's a ratio of voltage by current so this value should be maximum is the new voltage maximum and denominator is minimum similarly x q means the denominator should be minimum and the, the the numerator should be minimum and the denominator should be maximum so therefore this is vd max by id minimum and xq is equal to vd minimum by id maximum so this is a very important point so basically with the help of script test we can find the see we can find the xd and xq of a seven pole machine seven pole simple as machine so therefore i have already told you in the english alphabets d is always going to come earlier than q so xd is always greater than xq so if x is greater than this the numerator is more than the denominator here The numerator is lesser than the denominator, so therefore VD max by ID minimum. Here VD minimum by ID maximum. So with the help of these values, we can get the value of XD and XQ. This is called as direct axis reactant, and XQ is called as a causal axis reactant. The angle between the induced voltage and the supply voltage of a synchronous motor under running condition is always going to lie between the zero to ninety degree. This means I have already told you, F is called as the induced voltage and V is called as supply voltage. In a synchronous motor, I have already told you the general expression, which is V is equal to F plus I A into the S. So therefore, simply we can say that always V is always going to lead the E F. V is always going to lead the E F in case of the in case of the synchronous motor. So this the angle between the E F and I have already told you the angle between the E F and V is nothing but delta. So delta is always going to lie between zero to ninety degree. So always the delta, which is the phase angle between the E F and V, is going to always lie between zero and ninety degree at the running condition. These things I have already told you in the concept itself. So therefore, the angle between the induced voltage and the supply voltage of a synchronous motor under running condition is always lie between zero to ninety degree. So delta is the phase angle between the E F and the V. S R is called the short circuit ratio of a synchronous machine. So S R is nothing but it is a one by X S adjusted per per unit value. So X S adjusted. It is in terms of the per unit value. So S R is called as the short circuit ratio of synchronous machine. S R is called as the short circuit ratio of the synchronous machine. So S R is called as the short circuit ratio of the synchronous machine. So S R is equal to one by X S adjusted per unit value. So this is a very important point. S R is called as the short circuit ratio of the short circuit ratio of a synchronous machine. S R is equal to one by X S adjusted per unit value. So P is equal to P into omega s. For synchronous motor, we are going to apply. So P is equal to P into omega s. So P into two pi n s by sixty. For synchronous motor, n s is equal to one twenty by P. So this is general formula. P is equal to P into omega s. So P into two pi n s by sixty. That n s is equal to one twenty by P. For synchronous motor, because n s is equal to n s is equal to one twenty by P in the synchronous motor. So take a small example. Here basically this is the synchronous generator part phase diagram. For synchronous generator, this is basically part phase diagram. This is the E M F induced E F bar, and this J into X is equal to half of the energy. This is J zero point eight, and this is the load that we are going to count. Part phase diagram. This is the V bar terminal load job. Synchronous synchronous generator. Let me assume the amount of power required is one per unit. Then this is basically U P F load. Then V is called as a terminal voltage and X is called as a synchronous reactance. And R we are going to get negative. As it's a single phase, or you can say as it's a part phase diagram, so P is equal to V I into cos theta. In the question they are asking, P is equal to one, so one is equal to. In the question they are given, voltage is equal to V is equal to one point one. They are already given. You have to assume like that. And the current I we need to figure out. And the power factor of the load is one. So therefore, if you solve this, we are going to get current is equal to zero point nine zero zero point nine zero nine. And I already told you. The vector equation E F bar is equal to V bar plus I A into J X S. So you are going to get E F bar is equal to V value we know. So it is a U P F load. So V and I are in phase with respect to each other. So V bar is nothing but simply here I want it to be one point one at the angle of zero degree plus here V is nothing but I A is also same. It is in phase because it is a U P F load. So what about this current is nothing but I A or I can use anything. So I A is again same thing which is zero point nine zero at the angle of zero degree into What are the reactants is 90 degree leading to the fourth. X is nothing but X is equal to point eight at an angle of 90 degree. So if we solve this equation, we are going to get finally E bar is equal to some P value we are going to get. If we solve this, we are going to get and some value P at an angle of 3.46 degree. So now we can say the phase angle between the E F and V is called as delta. The delta is nothing but 3.46 degree. So like this, we have to find what is this? This is called as a delta. This thing I have already told you. So therefore, delta is equal to 
is a face angle between the EF and the V. So delta is nothing but is a face angle between the EF and the V. Here basically IA is nothing but IA. Here I is equal to IA basically. So therefore, we are going to get the face angle between the, which we can say, delta is called as a load angular, torque angular, power angle, which is the face angle between the EF and the V. EF is called as the induced voltage and V is called as the terminal voltage. Okay. So power factor is nothing but power factor is equal to cos phi is equal to P by angle to P square plus Q square. So therefore, that is nothing but very simple. The synchronous impedance is equal to over circuit voltage by the rated RF current per phase by at the constant field current. See, field current should be always constant for over circuit voltage and the, the rated current at the per phase, the rated RF current per phase. So therefore, we are going to get R plus J excess. So, so listen carefully, I have already told you, ZS is called synchronous impedance. It is basically the ratio of the open circuit voltage by the uh, rated armature current. Basically, it's a per phase value at a constant IF. So, whenever IF is a constant, at the constant value, we have to see what is the value of VOC and what is the value of the rated phase voltage. And we have to do the ratio of these two things to get the value of the ZS. So, listen carefully, ZS is the ratio of the open circuit voltage by the rated armature current per phase current. And we have to do at a constant IF value. This is called RF plus J excess. I have already told you, for leading load to a synchronous generator, for a synchronous generator, EF is always going to lead the V. This yes, since I have already told you, so therefore, EF is equal to under root over V cos theta plus IARA whole square plus V sin theta. Here, plus is used for the lagging load and minus is used for the leading load. So, my, minus IA into excess whole square. So, this is a very important point that you always have to remember this one. Because XA plus XL is nothing but excess. So, plus is for lagging load and minus is for the leading load. So, this is a very important point. Leading load connected to synchronous generator. So, leading load is connected to synchronous ge generator. Then, what is the value of percentage regulation EF minus V by V into 100? So, we know the value of EF, we know the value of V. So, we can solve this one and do the multiplication by 100. Then, we are going to get the percentage voltage regulation. So, EF is equal to 100 to V cos theta plus IA RA whole square plus V sin theta plus or minus IA excess whole square. Plus is used for lagging load connected to synchronous generator and minus is used for leading load connected to synchronous generator. So these are the important formulas that you always have to keep remembering. If you know VF, EF substitute EF, then we can get the value of the percentage regulation. These are basically per phase values. These are the per phase value. So we have to use the per phase terminal voltage also we have to use. If this is per phase, definitely this must be also per phase. Then you can solve this equation to get the value of the percentage regulation of the alternator. So now we will discuss some important points regarding the shared pole induction motor. Some facts about the shared pole induction motor. The motor runs in the direction of the unshared part of the pole to the shared part of the pole. This point I have already told you in very detailed manner. Here always in a shared pole single phase induction motor, always the motor is going to run from the unshared part of the pole to the shared part of the pole. And the direction of this motor cannot be changed. Basically, See, basically I can say that yes, we cannot change it when the machine is fixed. But you can change it. Suppose if you have a freedom to change the shading coils, then you can change the direction of the direction of this motor. But if the machine is fixed, then you cannot do it. So therefore, if you change the direction of the direction of shading coils, yes, you can rotate the, you can reverse direction of the rotation of the motor. This motor is highly noisy. Yes, this motor is very highly noisy. The rotor always runs from unshared part of the pole to the shared part as the area flux magnitude is not constant and as it is unbalanced rotating magnetic field, motor is highly noisy. See, always I have already told you the rotor always runs from unshared part of the pole to the shared part as the area flux magnitude is not constant and as it has unbalanced rotating magnetic field, so we can say motor is highly noisy. See, as the area of flux magnitude is not constant, as it is unbalanced rotating magnetic field, so motor is highly noisy because whatever the area of flux magnitude is not constant and is a varying and is unbalanced, so because of this only we can say the motor is highly noisy. So we can say that the motor is always going to, the motor runs in direction of the unshared part of the pole to the shared part of the pole. And the direction of, and the, direction of the rotation of the, of the motor cannot be changed if the poles are, if the shading poles are of the fix. Suppose if you can vary them, yes, then you can change the direction of this rotation of this motor. And this motor is highly noisy because here always I have already told the, the rotor is always going to run from 
and shared part of the pool to the shared part as the area of flux magnitude is not constant and it is unbalanced in nature and also it is a rotating magnetic field so either the basically whatever the area of flux magnitude is not constant and it is unbalanced and is always rotating so because of these reasons we can say what the motor is highly noisy and always the magnetic field the magnetic field in the shared part is always going to land the, the magnitude in the unshaded pole so always whatever the magnetic field in the shading part is always going to lag the magnetic field in the unshaded part. So now we will discuss some facts about the synchronous machine. The armature MMF and field MMF rotate with the same speed. The two MMFs that is the armature MMF and the field MMF must be tested with respect to each other. So always this is a very important point. The armature MMF and the field MMF are going to rotate with the same speed which is synchronous speed and also they are going to rotate in the same direction with the same speed. So we can say both are stationary with respect to one another. So both are stationary with respect to one another. So therefore simply we can say that the armature MMF and the field MMF rotate with the same speed which is synchronous speed and these two MMF that is the armature MMF and the field MMF must be stationary with respect to each other. And in what I told you, for geo power factor lagging current, the armature MMF demadizes the main field MMF in an alternator. These things I have already told you for ZPF current, for ZPF lagging current, for zero power factor lagging current, the armature MMF demadizes the main field MMF in an alternator. Similarly, for ZPF lead current, for ZPF lead current, the nature of armature MMF is demadizing the main field MMF in the synchronous motor. These things I have already told you. You have to assume it is a alternator and then you have to change the current IA by 180 degree and whatever the analysis that you are going to get, it is for the synchronous motor. And also I have already told you, for silent pole machine always, the direct axis reactance is always greater than the, the coverage axis the coverage reactors, the coverage reactors, reactors because I have already told you basically here in ABCD in English alphabet is always B is going to come earlier than Q so therefore we can say XQ is always greater than XQ and always XQ is not equal to synchronous reactants. This is a very important point. The whatever the coverage axis reactance is not at all, it is not equal to synchronous reactants. So we can say that the armature MMF and the field MMF are going to rotate with the same speed which is NS and the two MMF that is the armature MMF and the field MMF must be stationary with respect to each other because they are going to rotate with the same speed and also in the same direction. So listen carefully the armature MMF and the field MMF they are going to rotate with the same speed NS and always in the same direction and the two MMF that is the armature MMF and the field MMF must be stationary with respect to each other and also I have already told you for zero power for zero power factor lagging current the armature MMF demandizes the main field MMF in an alternator similarly for a jerpy of lead current the nature of the armature MMF is demandizing the main field MMF in a synchronous Motor. And also I have already told you for silent pole synchronous machine always the direct axis reactance is always greater than the coordinate axis reactance and always X Q is not equal to E X S. Damper windings are used to prevent the hunting in a synchronous machine. I have already told you damper windings are used to prevent the hunting in a synchronous machine. Hunting means I have already told you suppose whenever there is a sudden change in load, either increasing load or decreasing load, then we can say that simply the motor for synchronous motor we can say that it is going to fluctuate from its synchronous speed. Uh, suppose rotor speed can be less than NS or, or rotor speed can be greater than NS. So therefore, the machine is going to hunt for a new stable point that is called as the hunting. So therefore, the damper windings are used to prevent the hunting in a synchronous machine. So with the help of the damper windings, so now the hunting can be removed because now even though it has less than or less or it has greater than less at that instant, but because of this that because of these damper windings, then still we are going to get NR is equal to NS finally. So therefore, hunting means basically we can say that whenever there is a sudden change in load, the synchronous machine tries to find a new stable point and with the help of damper winding, the new stable point will be again the previous original load which is NR is equal to NS. So damper windings are used to prevent the hunting in a synchronous machine. Excess calculated at higher exciting currents is lesser than that of the lower excitations. Excess calculated at higher exciting currents is lesser than that of lower excitations. I have already told you in a EMF method, I, as I have already told you, it, it will be like this one. So I have already told you here basically 
I have already told this important point. This is the graph that you are going to get the synchronous impedance measure for. If you if you if you basically have the two important things of so one is called as open circuit characteristics and the other and, and the another thing is called as the short circuit characteristics. If you know these two things, then for a constant I F, then what is the value of synchronous impedance which is open circuit voltage by the short circuit current, the armature short circuit current at a fixed I F. Then I have already told you for a unsaturation region you are going to get a constant value. For saturation region you are going to get a some decreasing value. Means whenever the field current is increasing, whenever the excitation is increasing, the excess value is less than compared to lower excitation currents or lower field currents. So therefore, the excess value at higher exciting currents is always less than when compared to lower excitations. Yes, this point, uh, this point is also I've already told you. So therefore, excess calculated at higher exciting currents is always less than that of the lower excitation currents. Synchronous motor are preferred for driving loads requiring high power at low speeds. I have already told you, synchronous motor is always preferred for only low speed applications, whereas the induction motor is applicable for high speed applications. Synchronous motor is always applicable for low speed applications, whereas the induction motors are always applicable for high speed applications. Synchronous motors are preferred for driving loads requiring high power at low speed. So, which are the loads which require high power at low speeds, then we definitely we prefer the synchronous motor. So whenever a load requires, whenever a load requires a huge amount of power at low speeds, then we prefer the synchronous motor. So synchronous motors are preferred for driving loads requiring high power at low speeds. So wherever the loads which are requiring the high power at low speeds, then we always prefer the synchronous motor because I have already told you synchronous motor is always used for the low speed applications, whereas the induction motor is always used for the high speed applications. Siren pole. Siren pole synchronous motor are preferred for low speed and high power because it develops more power due to extra extra reluctance power. So siren pole, siren pole synchronous motor are preferred for low speed and high power applications because it develops a more power due to extra reluctance power. I have already told you basically that siren pole synchronous motor are preferred for low speed and high power because it develops a more power due to extra reluctance power. I have already told you the overall power equation in a reluctance motor which is a summation of the reluctance power and steady state power which is E into V by X into sin delta plus here V square by V square by 2 into 1 by X Q minus 1 by X V into sin to delta. I have already told you this important point. So you can see there is also reluctance power. So because of this extra reluctance power, it is used for high power applications with low speed because I have already told you always synchronous motor is always used for low speed applications. So wherever the load requires the high power with low speed, then we basically use the silent pole synchronous motor. So silent pole synchronous motor are preferred for low speed and high power because it delivers more power due to extra reluctance power. So I have already told you the extra reluctance power is nothing but V square by 2 into 1 by X Q minus 1 by X D into sin to delta. So because of this extra reluctance power it is used for high power applications with a low speed because all these synchronous motor are used only for the low speed applications. So finally I can say that silent pole synchronous motor are preferred for the low speed and high power applications because it is develops more power due to extra reluctance power. Pony motors are used to start synchronous motors but not start delta starters. So pony motors are used to start the synchronous motors but not the start delta starters. I have already told you pony motors are also called as the auxiliary motors. So because of these auxiliary motors only we are going to give an initial rotation. If you give an initial rotation then definitely the synchronous motor is going to initially act like induction motor and finally it is going to act like a synchronous motor. These things I have already told you it is going to give an initial push of rotation. It is going to basically give an initial push of rotation. So whenever you do this one, whenever you do an initial push and then if you give the ESS supply to the synchronous motor then definitely we can say that it is going to act like a, it is going to act like induction motor initially and later it is going to act like a synchronous motor. So what are these pony motors are also called as the auxiliary motors. They are going to give an initial start for these synchronous motors. So because these are not self-starting, so we have to give some initial push. I have already told you there are two motors. One is called as a managing auxiliary motor and the other one is by using damper windings. So with the help of these two things, we can give an initial push for the synchronous motor to rotate. So it is going to act like now basically. So now it will have the starting torque. An induction motor is started with a star delta starter. 
the starting current and the starting torque compared to direct on a starting and induced by 1 by 3 and 1 by 3. I already told you in an induction motor, started with the start delta starter, the starting current and the starting torque compared to the torque direct on a starter are induced by. I already told you one important point, this point that you always have to remember. See, for an induction motor, the sticker winding can be connected either in star fashion or either in delta fashion, but always, but always the armature coil should be always connected in the star fashion. Whereas, if you take in the case of synchronous machine, the stator coil or the armature coil is always, always should be connected in a star connection only. These things I have told you in a very detailed manner. So, now let me tell you here, see, basically direct online means, uh, direct online means simply we can say that whatever the stator coil, whatever the stator coil of induction machine is in the delta fashion. But now, for star delta starter, initially we are going to connect the stator winding in a star connection and later we are going to convert into delta fashion. So now whatever the starting current because of the star delta is equal to 1 by 3 times the starting torque because of DOL. Similarly, the starting current with the help of the star delta starter is equal to 1 by 3 times of the starting current of the DOL. So therefore, if you, give a, if you use the star, star connection for stator, whatever the torque and whatever the starting current, they are going to be reduced by 1 by 3 when compared to delta fashion. That, that is what it is going to indicate. All the starting torque is directly proportional to phase voltage volt square. Phase voltage volt square. Phase voltage volt square. And the starting current must be basically, these are called as the line currents. See them carefully. The starting current means here, these are the line currents of delta and line currents of star. And the starting torque is always directly proportional to phase voltage volt square. So, this is a very important point that you always have to understand. See, sludge formation in transformer oil is due to oxidation of transformer oil. I have already told you, sludge formation in transformer oil is due to oxidation of transformer oil. Under full load operation of the transformer, full amount of losses are taken place which produce heat, heat in the core. This heat absorbed by the transformer oil and gets oxidized. Hence, sludge found in the transformer oil. So, whenever the sludge formation in transformer oil is due to oxidation of transformer oil, because under full load operation of transformer, full amount of loss are going to take in place, which produces lot of heat in the core. This heat is absorbed by the transformer oil and gets oxidized, and as the sludge is going to form in the transformer oil. So, therefore, we can say that the sludge formation in transformer oil is due to oxidation of transformer oil. So, under the full load operation of transformer, full amount of losses are going to take place in the take place, so which produces lot of heat in the core. This heat is absorbed by the transformer oil and gets oxidized. Hence, the sludge is going to form in the transformer oil. So, this is a very important point. See here, always sludge formation transformer oil is due to oxidation of transformer oil. So, under full load operation of transformer, full amount of loss are going to take place, which produces heat in the core. This heat absorbed by the transformer oil and gets oxidized. Hence, the sludge is going to form in the transformer oil. So, whenever, see basically, suppose if you are going to keep a full load for a transformer, so, loss will be very high. So, these losses have been absorbed by the transformer oil and it is going to get oxidized. Then we are going to get a sludge. So, now the sludge is going to form in the transformer oil. So, sludge formation transformer oil is due to oxidation of the transformer oil. Under full load operation of transformer, full amount of losses are taken place, which produces heat in the core. This heat absorbed by the transformer oil and gets oxidized. Hence, the sludge is formed in the transformer oil. See, in a DC machine, in a DC machine, the armature is always on the rotor unlike an AC machine where it could be either on the stator or rotor because commutation action would otherwise not be possible. I have already told you in a DC machine, in a DC machine the armature is always on the rotor unlike on AC machine whether it could be on either on the stator or rotor because commutation action would otherwise not be possible. I have already told you in a DC machine always the armature winding will be always on the rotor whereas for a AC machine the armature winding can be either on the stator in that be on the rotor. I have already told you for AC machines, for low rating machines, the armature, wide, the armature is on the rotor, but for high rating machines, the armature is on the, the armature coil is on the stator. These things I have told you because in DC machine, combustion is always necessary. That is the reason we are going to keep the armature winding on the, armature winding on the rotor. Whereas for AC machine, combustion is not necessary, so we can keep either on the stator or either on the rotor. 
the requirement of mechanical rectifier operation in this generator and mechanical inverter operation in the DC motor demand that the armature and the computer should be placed on rotor and field winding on the stator. The requirement of mechanical rectifier operation in this generator and mechanical inverter operation in the DC motor demand that the armature and the computer should be placed on the rotor and field winding on the stator. I have already told you, see at this generator, the computer is going to act like a mechanical rectifier in case of this generator and the computer is going to act like a mechanical inverter in case of this motor. So always the armature and the computer should be always be placed together. Then only we can say this inverter, the mechanical inverter and the mechanical mechanical inverter and the mechanical rectifier operation is going to get to work. So whenever the armature coil and the computer should be always placed together on the motor itself, then then only these two possible conditions are going to happen, which is a mechanical rectification and the mechanical inverter operations. So this is the reason always we have to keep the field winding on the stator and the armature winding on the rotor with the combination of the computer. So therefore, the requirement of mechanical rectifier operation in DC generator and mechanical inverter operation in DC motor demand that the armature and the armature coil and the computer should be always placed on the rotor and field winding on the stator. In a series motor, torque is directly proportional to I s square because I already told you in the unsaturation region, in the unsaturation region, flux is directly proportional to armature current and I a is equal to I f is equal to I l because armature current is equal to field current is equal to load current in case of DC series motor. An electric train employing a DC series motor under running conditions maintains constant torque even a sudden slight drop in the main voltage occurs such as I a is maintained constant. So, T is directly proportional to I s square but due to Production in main voltage, back EMF is reduced because back EMF is directly proportional to supply voltage. Hence, there is a drop in the speed which is N is directly proportional to EB. So, listen carefully. In series motor, torque is directly proportional to I square because RMC current is equal to field current is equal to load current. Then, an electric train employing a DC series, DC series motor under running conditions maintains a constant torque even a sudden slight drop in the mains voltage occurs. See, basically what I am trying to say is, suppose Suppose basically whenever, suppose basically whenever a sudden drop in voltage is going to get occur, then even then the torque will be always constant because such that I A is maintained constant. So therefore torque is always generally proportional to I A square because even there is a sudden drop in voltage, but still the torque will be always constant. As the torque is constant, so always I A will be always constant. But due to reduction in the main voltage V, back EMF is reduced. Hence, there is a drop in the speed because N is directly proportional to EB. I have already told you. So, what I am trying to say is basically whenever in an electric train we are going to use a DC series motor. So, whenever there is a sudden drop in voltage, then definitely the torque will be always constant for a DC series motor. But as the supply voltage decreases, the vacuum of decreases, so speed is also going to get decreased. So, the torque will be constant. So, this is the business of this series motor. An electric train employing a DC series motor under running conditions maintains the constant torque. Even a sudden slight drop in the main voltage occurs such that I is always maintained constant. But due to reduction in main voltage, vacuum is reduced and hence there is a drop in speed. So, what I am trying to say is electric trains are going to basically use this DC series motor. So, whenever the supply voltage is reduced, whenever the supply voltage is reduced by a small amount, the torque will be always constant. So, I is always constant. But if the supply voltage decreases, vacuum is decreases, so speed is also going to get decreased. So, this is the thing that you always have to remember. As I is a constant, flux is a constant because N is very proportional to EB by 5. As I is a constant, flux is a constant. So, therefore, N is very proportional to EB. The air gap flux density or resultant flux wave form of an uncompensated two-pole DC stand motor is distorted flat top waveform. The air gap flux density or resultant flux waveform of an uncompensated two-pole DC stand motor is distorted flat top wave. So this is a very important point. The air gap flux density or resultant flux wave form of an uncompensated two-pole DC stand motor is distorted flat top wave form. So always the air gap flux density or resultant flux wave form of an uncompensated two-pole DC, DC motor is always distorted flat wave form. So if you go for the compensated, the, you, you, you are going to get an undistorted flat top wave form. But if it is uncompensated means you are going to get a distorted flat top wave form. Suppose if you get the compensation then you are going to get a purely flat top wave form. Otherwise uncompensated means you are going to get a distorted flat top wave form. So therefore the air gap flux density or the resultant flux wave form of an uncompensated two-pole DC shunt motor is the distorted flat top wave form. 
the NDF flux density or resultant flux wave form of an uncompensated two point DC shunt motor is distorted flat top waveform. See, uncompensated means you are going to get a distorted flat top waveform. For compensated, you are going to get a pure flat top waveform. So, this is the graph with respect to B and theta. So, you can see clearly this is the graph that, that I am trying to tell you. So, this is a flat top waveform, but there is a distortion. But there is a distortion. Suppose if you are not going to, suppose if you are going to do composition, then you are going to get a purely like a flat top waveform. Because as you not did the, because as you not did the, because I not did the, this one, basically we can say that as you not did this composition, you are going to get a distorted. So, one important point that you always have to remember, see, for a DC, for an induction machine, for P poles, for a P poles on the stator, and if you give P by two cycles of AC supply, we are going to get one one rotation of the air gap flux. But as for synchronous machine, for P poles on the rotor, for P poles on the rotor, and if you give a rotation, and if you go for one rotation of this rotor, then you are going to get P by two cycles of any cycles are going to induced in the stator coil. So listen carefully for induction machine, for for P poles induced on the stator, and if you give P by two cycles of any supply, we are going to get one cycle rotation of the air gap flux. For synchronous machine, for P poles on the rotor and if you give one rotation of this rotor then you are going to get P by 2 cycles of A cycles are going to get induced in the stator coils. So, this is a torque with respect to speed whenever the harmonics are going to get present. So, listen carefully, whenever the harmonics, whenever the harmonics are present in the flux, the flux between the stator and the rotor, then the torque speed characteristic is going to get changed in this manner. So, this is a, this is also a stable region and this is also a stable region. So, because of this only, the crawling is going to get happen. So, speed will be very less, which is nearly equal to NS by 7. So, this is the resultant machine torque whenever the harmonics are going to get present. So, th so this is the overall torque speed curve whenever the harmonics are going to get present. You can see this is a stable region and this is also a stable region. So, because of this stable region only, the crawling is going to get occur in the, the crawling is going to get occur in the three-phase induction motor. So, let me assume these are the result required load time. Suppose there is a load demand. So, 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 suppose let me assume a load is going to require this much amount of torque to rotation. As you can see, P is a stable point, R is a stable point and Q is an unstable point. And now you see what is going to necessarily happen. The general induction machine operates stably near to signal speed. The stable region of torque slip characteristics that is point R but here due to crawling effective, effective machine also may operate stable at point P. See, I have already told you, P is a stable point and R is a stable point and Q is an unstable point. See, the load is going to require basically this much amount of torque. Then, I have already told you, this is the resultant machine torque whenever the armors are going to get present. See, actually, actually, the whatever the load should operate at the high speed across the point R, but sometimes it can act at the stable at point P also. But at point B, the speed is very less. So, we can say that, see, uh, sometimes a motor can even rotate at the point P or point R. The torque, the torque demand is same, but the speed is different. Here, the speed is very less when compared to speed here. So, we can say this is said to be crawling. See, the induction motor may think that this point P is a stable and it is going to run at a very low speed. This effort is called the crawling because of the orbits and the flux are going to present. So, therefore, in general, induction machine operates stable in near to sink on a speed. This stable region of torque speed characteristics, that is point R. But here, due to crawling, the but due to but here due to crawling effect the machine may also operate stably at point P. So because of this crawling effect the machine may also operate stably at the point P. Higher synchronous reactance is preferred in the present day alternators because one can have reduced harmonic currents. See whenever the synchronous reactance is higher the harmonic current is going to get reduced because both are inverse the proportional because I is equal to V by Z. More is the synchronous impedance, you are going to get less amount of harmonic currents. So, higher synchronous reactance is preferred in the present day alternators because one can have reduced harmonic currents. So, higher synchronous reactance is preferred in the present day alternators because one can have reduced harmonic currents. But I have already told you, the voltage regulation of an alternator is highly proportional to synchronous impedance. As excess increases, then the voltage also increases. So, voltage regulation of alternator is also going to get increased. So, we can say that higher synchronous reactance is preferred in the present day alternators because one can have the reduced harmonic currents. So, one can have the reduced harmonic currents because of this advantage only. Nowadays, 
The power factor at starting becomes very small. The power factor at starting becomes very small. Hence, for the same current, torque delivered to rotor and starting torque becomes very small. I have already told you, inductor means basically we can say that here we are going to add an auxiliary winding. So, if you are not going to keep any capacitor, so overall it is an inductive circuit. So, whatever the alpha, the alpha between the IA, IM and the IA is very less. So, torque is also very less. So, whatever the power the load is also to the rotor is very less. So, hence, same current we are going to draw with the same power, but the torque is very less because alpha is very less. So, in series inductor method of starting of induction motor, the power factor starting becomes very small because alpha is very, so we can say that, see basically we can say that of alpha is less. So, we can say, so whatever the power factor is, the, the angle between the supply voltage and supply current is also very large. So, because of this, we can say the power factor is also very small. Hence, for the same current, power delivered to rotor, the starting torque becomes small because I have already told you as alpha, as alpha is very, see basically alpha, whatever the alpha between the IM and IA is very very small, so it is very very small, so the starting torque is always that is proportional to IM into IA into sin alpha, as alpha decreases, sin alpha decreases, so starting torque also decreases, but the resultant current is a summation of the main winding current and the auxiliary winding current, then the angle between the supply voltage and the resultant current is very huge. So, power factor is also very small. So, this is the things that are going to happen. The starting torque is very less and the power factor is also very less if you are not going to keep any capacitor to the auxiliary winding. So, in this inductor method of starting of induction motor, the power factor at the, the power factor of the starting becomes very small. Hence, for the same current power delivered to rotor and the starting torque becomes very small. A DC shunt generator when driven without connecting field winding shows an open circuit terminal voltage of. So, a DC shunt motor when driven without connecting field winding shows an open circuit terminal voltage of this dual voltage or BR volt when B when field winding is connected and excited the terminal voltage drops to zero because the field winding has got wrongly connected means field flux and the outer flux oppose each other and net air gap flux is zero. So listen carefully a decision generator when driven without connecting field winding shows an open circuit terminal voltage of V0 volts. It is called as a because of the because of this residual flux then we are going to get a voltage of V0 volt. See, whenever the field current is, see, whenever the field current is zero, but due to residual magnetism of the poles, we are going to get a V0 volt. It, it, it is called as a residual voltage. When field winding is connected, when field winding is connected and excited, the terminal voltage drops to zero because the field winding as wrongly connected means field flux and the armature flux opposes each other and the net air gap flux is zero. See, whenever the field flux. So, whenever the field flux and the armature flux should always be in the same direction or simply we can say what of the field flux and the residual flux should be in the same direction. If they are opposite definitely the net flux should be 0 and the net resultant voltage is also equal to 0. So, always the field flux and the uh, field flux and the residual flux should be always in the same direction. Basically, this is a residual flux not armature flux. It is a residual flux. They should be in the same direction. Then only the EMF will increase Otherwise, EMF will decrease and it will become to zero. This is basically residual flux, not the armature flux. So, therefore, a DC shunt generator when driven without connecting field winding shows an open circuit terminal voltage of V0. V0 is voltage because here, because of the residual flux. When field winding is connected and excited, the terminal voltage drops to zero because the field winding is wrongly connected means field flux and the residual flux. This is basically residual flux. This is basically the residual flux. So, opposite each other and the energy flux is 0. So, so, because of that, EMF is also equal to 0. So, always whatever the field winding should support that in the same direction of the, of the result, then only self-exaggeration is possible. Otherwise, self-exaggeration is not at all possible. Generally, in synchronous generator, divided winding rotor is preferred to a conventional winding rotor since it gives more damping resistance that is better damping. Generally, in synchronous generator, divided winding rotor Divided winding rotor is preferable to a conventional winding rotor since it gives more damping resistance that is better damping. So, what is the damping resistance then we can easily prevent the hunting in a small amount of time. So, therefore, generally in synchronous mode generator divided 
divided winding rotor is preferable to a conventional winding rotor since it gives more damping resistance that is better damping so therefore simply we can say that in a synchronous generator so in a synchronous generator in a generally in a synchronous generator divided winding rotor is preferable to a conventional winding rotor since it gives more damping resistance that is better damping so because of the more damping resistance or better damping only we are going to prefer the divided winding rotor when we come to conventional winding rotor so see because of the more damping resistance or better damping only we are going to prefer the divided winding rotor than the conventional winding rotor so generally in synchronous generator divided winding rotor is preferable to a conventional winding rotor since it gives more damping resistance that is better damping so p is equal to v into i into cos phi is equal to constant let me assume this is called the constant let me assume v is also constant f is also constant for synchronous rotor then i is the minimum at upf and i is value of the jpf so this is a very important point here listen carefully i is minimum at upf this you can see clearly 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 at what one clearly in the weaker in the weaker i have already told you i is minimum at the upf or we can say at the normal excitation at the normal excitation and i is maximum at the zero power factor zero power factor either leading up either lagging at any case you are going to get i is maximum so we can say simply that i is minimum at the upf and i is maximum at either zero power factor leading up zero power factor lagging these things i have already told you in the graph of v curve see in the v curve you can see clearly in the v curve you can see in the v curve see in the v curve i is minimum at the unity power factor and i is maximum i is maximum either at zero power factor lagging or zero power factor leading these things i have already told you you can compare you can see both the v curve and the inverted v curve v curve is a graph between the ia and if and inverted graph is a graph between the power factor and the if so you can see clearly at normal excitation at normal at normal excitation you are going to get ia is a minimum and the power factor is unity whereas the at the over excitation or the at the under excitation basically at zero power factor lagging or zero power factor leading so you go for any of the thing then definitely you are going to get ia as a maximum we can see clearly from that graphs also so p is equal to v into i into cos phi is a constant so v is a constant f is a constant for synchronous motor so p is also constant just by seeing is what i am trying to say is basically i am just changing the excitation i am just changing the excitation only i am just changing the excitation only but i am not changing the mechanical input mechanical input is a constant but i am changing on the excitation so i already told you if you change the excitation i is going to get change and also power factor is going to get change and nature of the power factor the lagging or leading also it is going to get change all these things are going to get changes with the help of the excitation and ef is also going to get change the amount of induced voltage is also going to get change all these things i have already told you the uh, ratio of the start torque by full load torque is equal to starting current by full load current is equal to full load slip by starting slip a uh, starting slip is equal to 1 so we can keep here full load slip so therefore start torque by full load torque is equal to starting current by full load current is equal to full load slip because i have already told you the torque expression is equal to torque expression is equal to very simple p is equal to t into omega so t is equal to p by omega so now here p is nothing but rotor input rotor input is nothing but rotor copper loss by s yes. so therefore 1 by omega s yes into here rotor 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 copper loss is in a three phase which is 3 into i to square r2 by s yes. so we are going to get finally we can say that the torque is that the proportional to the we can simply say that i square by i i2 square by s yes, i2 square by s yes. so therefore we are going to get starting torque by full load torque is equal to starting current full load current whole square into full load slip by starting slip a starting slip is equal to 1 we are going to keep it as a 1 so st means starting fl means full load it's for the induction motor so in dc motor during stalling condition during stalling condition means here the rotor will never rotate during stalling condition means the rotor will never rotate see whenever the rotor will even though you are keeping the load that load is very higher than the maximum torque delivered by this machine by this dc motor then it will never rotate so therefore then we can say m is equal to zero so m is also equal to zero so therefore this is called as the stalling condition means you are keeping a load which is higher than the maximum torque see you are keeping a load which is having a load torque which is higher than the maximum torque delivered by this dc motor then it will never rotate so therefore speed is equal to zero so m is equal to zero so due to stalling condition always rotor speed is equal to zero so therefore m is equal to zero loaded this generator if the bridges are given a shift from the interpolar axis in the direction of the in a loaded 
these generated if the bridges are given a shift from the interval axis in the direction of the, the direction of rotation, then the conversion will improve with fall of terminal voltage. I have already told you, this is a very important reason. Suppose whenever you shift the, whenever you shift the brushes in the direction of the, in the direction of the brushes, yes, combination is improving, combination is improving, but one thing is here, further demandation is going to get present. So, whenever there is a further demandation, the flux will decrease, whenever the resultant flux decreases, EG decreases, whenever the EG decreases, definitely the terminal voltage is also going to get decreased. So, this is a very important point that you always have to remember. So, therefore, in a loaded bill generator, if the brushes are given a shift from the interpolar axis in the direction of the rotation, interpolar axis is also called as the GMA, then definitely we can say that then the combination is going to get improved with the fall of terminal voltage, with the fall of terminal voltage. Suppose if you give opposite rotation, then what is going to happen if you give the opposite rotation, if you, suppose if you shift the brushes in the opposite direction of rotation of the generator, then the combination is going to get degraded. It will never improve, combination will never improve and also the terminal voltage will, the terminal voltage will increase. The terminal voltage will increase because this is a very important point. I have already told you, suppose if you are going to shift the brushes in the opposite direction of rotation, then this is the, the flux, armature flux direction, this is the armature flux. So, if you divide into two components, this is called as the demodization, this is the, this is the component flux in the same direction of 5F, so it is a magnetization. So, therefore, the flux will increase, so terminal voltage will increase. So, this is the important point that you always have to remember. Suppose if you shift the brushes in the opposite, in the same direction of the rotation, then this is the armature flux. So, if you take into two components, then it is opposite, this, this component is opposite to the field flux, so it is a demagination. So, flux will decrease, EG will decrease, so, ter so terminal voltage will decrease. Whereas, if you give the opposite rotation to the directional rotation of the rotor, then the brushes are in the armature flux in, the, in this direction, and the, this component is nothing but it is in the same direction of the 5F. So, therefore, it is going to increase, it is a magnetization, so flux will increase, so terminal voltage will increase, but the combustion will degrade. So, finally, I can say that in a loaded bridge generator, if the bridges are given a shift from the interpolar axis in the direction of the rotation, then the combustion will improve, but with fall of terminal voltage. But if you go over the reverse process, if you shift the bridges in the opposite of the rotation, then the combustion will degrade, it will degrade, but with the rising terminal voltage, this is quite opposite here. So, therefore, in the, pre, in the previous case, in this new case, we can say combustion will degrade and increase in terminal voltage. But here, if you shift in the same direction of the rotation of the generator, the combustion will improve with the fall of terminal voltage. DC machine, compositing winding is used for neutralizing the armature reaction while interval winding is used for improving combustion. I have already told you. See, this interval winding can do two things. It can improve the combustion and also it is going to neutralize the armature reaction under the interpol poles. So, listen, so listen think carefully, these interpols can do two functions, it can improve the competition and also it is going to neutralize, it is going to neutralize the armature reaction under the interpoles. So, therefore, or cross magnetizing MMF under the interpoles. So, in DC machine, compositing winding is used for neutralizing the armature reaction by interpol winding is used for improving the competition. So, in DC machines, compositing winding is used for neutralizing the armature reaction while interpol winding is used for improving the commutation. Compensating windings are created in series with the armature and it aids the commutation and provides MMF in the opposite direction as it of armature MMF. So, compensating winding are created in, in series with the armature and it aids commutation and provides MMF in the opposite direction as it of the armature flux. So, armature flux and this the compensating winding flux both are opposite so, it is always going to decrease the armature MMF. So, therefore, compensating winding are cut in series with the armature winding and its age computation, which it, will, it is going to improve the computation and produces and produces MMF in opposite direction as that of the armature MMF. To prevent the shifting of the narrative neutral axis caused by armature reaction in a DC machine, the most effective method is to, is to neutralize the armature flux, is to place compensating winding on the main poles. See, basically, I have already told you, Suppose if you are not going to keep any compensating things, then definitely MMA is going to get shift its axis from with respect to JNA. So if you want to remove this one, then you have to keep then you have to keep the 
both the compositing winding and also the finger pulling winding. So these two things that you always have to keep if you want, if you don't want to shift the MNA from GNA. So if you keep if you keep these two things always, the MNA will be always on the GNA only. So to prevent the shifting of the magnetic neutral axis caused by the armature reaction in this machine, the most effective method is to neutralize the armature flux. It is to, to neutralize the armature flux is to place compositing windings on the main pole faces. So compositing winding is always placed on the main pole faces and the interpole winding is always placed on the interpoles. These are kept in midway between the poles. So this is the very important point that I have already told you. So by keeping the compositing winding on the interpole winding, we are going to remove the armature reaction. So always M1 is going to now coincide with the GNA. So these things I have already told you. In these generators, compositing windings are located in teeth cut out in main force and are series connected for cancellation of the armature reaction at any node. I already told you, in these generators, composite binding are connected, are, are, are located in the teeth cut on the main force. On the main, on the main force, we are going to own this composite binding and are series connected for cancellation of the armature reaction at any node because they are going to continue the series with the armature binding. So this whatever the MNF produced by this composite binding is opposite to the MNF produced by the armature binding. So this is going to remove this armature MMF. It is going to cancel the armature reaction finally. The introduction of interpoles in within the main force improves the performance of a DC machine because a counter EMF is induced in the coil undergoing the competition. So basically it is going to cancel the reactance voltage by, by using an another voltage which is counter EMF. So overall voltage is going to get decreased. So, here basically with the help of interpoles, it is going to produce a counter EMF in the coil which is undergoing the competition. So, the reactor's load is going to get decreased. See, competition means basically what I am trying to say is competition means, see, at an instant, at an instant, the one coil is going to get short circuit because W is going to lie on the two complete segments. So, it is going to act like a short circuit. At that time, whatever the current in that coil should change its direction, should change its direction. But, suppose, in the, in, the, in, the amount of, in, the, in the amount of time the combustion time, whatever the voltage is going from one segment to another segment, come to the segment, the time is called the PC. In the time only, the current should change its direction from one axis to other axis. But if it is not changing, means definitely we can say that then we are going to get a spark. If it is changing, means yes, no spark is going to get occur. See, it may not change because, it may not change completely because, because of the, because of the, reactance voltage because of the inductance property or we can say reactance voltage. So because of this it may have the non-changing, it will never change completely. So because of that the spark is being, sparking is going to get occurred. So we have to remove that reactance voltage with the help of this intervals. We are going to reduce that reactance voltage. So now the current can change fully in the TC only it is going to change fully. So we can say no spark is going to get occurred. So conversion is always successful. So therefore introduction of intervals in between the main pulse improves the performance of a DC machine because the counter EMF is, is induced in the coil which is undergoing the competition. So now we are going to discuss about the some more important points. The losses in the transformer are basically copper losses, iron losses, or core losses and the stray load losses and the dielectric loss. So if you want to mention, see the basically the losses in the transformer are of these types. One is called as the copper loss, iron loss is also called as the core loss, stray load loss and the dielectric loss. So we can say there are only four losses. There are only four losses which are going to be present in the transformer, which are called as the copper loss. Iron loss is also called as the core loss, stray load losses and the dielectric losses. So these are the four types of losses which are going to be present in the transformer, which are called as the copper loss. Iron loss is also called as the core loss, stray load loss and the dielectric loss. Whereas the stray load loss and the Dielectric, dielectric loss are very very less, so we are going to neglect them for all the practical conditions. But ideally, by speaking, we can say that there are four losses, which is called as the copper loss, and the iron loss or core loss, and the strain load loss and the dielectric loss. Area of BH curve is going to tell you about the hysteresis loss in one cycle, or simply we can say the hysteresis loss per one cycle. See whatever the area of the BH loop, so the area of the BH curve is going to tell you the amount of hysteresis loss in one cycle of supply. So if you give one cycle, one cycle of AC supply, the amount of hysteresis loss is equal to area of the BH loop. So therefore we can say that area of the BH loop is going to tell you area of the BH curve or BH loop it is going to tell you the hysteresis loss in one cycle of supply. So hysteresis loss in one cycle of supply. So therefore we can say the hysteresis loss per one cycle of supply. So whatever the BH, the area under the BH curve or BH loop, it is going to tell you 
the amount of esterase slurs which are going to occur per once one cycle of supply so one cycle of supply or one time period of supply then total esterase loss is equal to area of the bh curve into frequency of the operation of the transformer supply because if you want to go for a frequency for if for a uh, voltage tool frequency is nothing but number of cycles in one second number of cycles in one second so therefore this is called the frequency you have to multiply these two things because area of bh, BH curve is going to tell you only for one cycle so in a frequency there are f number of cycles in one second so you have to multiply by frequency then you are going to get the total stress loss in one second so total stress loss is nothing but it is the total loss in one second which is the area of the bh curve into frequency of the operation of transformer supply so then you are going to get the total stress loss in one second so in one second how much amount of total stress loss is happening that we can easily figure out which is called as a ph so therefore Total stress loss is nothing but the amount of loss which is going to occur in one second is equal to area of the BH loop into the frequency of the operation of the transformer supply because area of the BH curve is going to tell you only the stress loss in one cycle. So if you multiply by frequency, then you are going to get the total stress loss in one second. Suppose when V by F is not equal to constant, then what is going to happen? I have already told you whenever V by F is not equal to constant, the stress loss, I have already told you which is eta into eta into bm to the power of x into f into v. So therefore, eta into bm to the power of x into f into v. So bm is nothing but v by f. So if we do this one, we are going to get v to the power of x into f to the power of 1 minus x into volume of core. This is nothing but volume of core. So this is the velocity, this is the voltage that you are going to apply. So finally, you are going to get, let me assume x is equal to 1.6, then we are going to get eta into v to the power of 1.6 into f to the power of minus 0.6 into volume of the core and its P is called as the voltage. So you can see clearly, let me assume the supply voltage is a constant, then we can say the essential plus that is proportional to frequency to the power of minus 0.6. See as the frequency increases, I can write in another fashion also 1 by f to the power of 0.6. So whenever frequency increases, the denominator increases, so overall value decreases. So whenever the frequency increases, the stress loss is going to get decreased whenever the V by F is not equal to constant. So as the frequency increases, the denominator increases. So therefore, simply we can say that the stress losses will decrease. Other than winding and core, the losses happens are called as the strain load losses and this depends on the load current and these losses are only 0.5 percentage of the output power. Other than winding and the core, the losses. See, other than the winding loss and the core losses happening are called as the strain load losses. I have already told you there are basically four losses in the transformer, ideally speaking, which are called as the copper losses, iron losses, also called as the core loss, strain load loss and the dielectric loss. So, other than winding and the core losses happening are called as the strain load losses. So, other than core loss and the copper losses, there is also one more loss which is called as the strain load losses and these are going to depend upon the load current. So, this basically, these strain load losses are going to depend upon the amount of the output current or you can say load current and these losses are only 0.5 percentage of the output power. So, it is a very, very less value. So, we are going to neglect it for all the ideal cases. So, therefore, we are going to neglect it because it is going to depend upon the load current. So, we are always going to neglect it because it is only 0.5 percentage of the output power. So, other than winding and the, or you can say, other than copper and the core losses happening, which are called as the strain load losses. These are, these losses are going to depend upon the output current and these are only, these losses are only 0.5 percent of the output power. These are only 0.5, 0.5 percentage of the output power. Losses in the insulation parts of transformer is called as the dielectric loss. So then what is the meaning of dielectric loss? Dielectric loss, di dielectric loss means whatever the losses in the insulation parts of the transformer it is called as a dielectric loss and these are only 0.25 percent of the output power. So this is, as you can see clearly, this is 0 0.25 percentage and this is 5 percentage. So this is, this is basically lesser. This is even lesser than this one. So this is 0 0.50 you can write this is 0 0.25 this is always lesser when compared to this one so therefore this is also very less so we are going to negate this one also so therefore losses in the insulation parts of the transformer is called as the dielectric loss and these are only 0.25 percent of the output power so these are only 0.25 percentage of the output power so as this is a very very less so we are going to negate the this dielectric loss also so ideally speaking there are four losses copper losses iron or core losses and the strain of losses and the dielectric losses see whatever the losses in the winding it is called as the 
copper losses and what are the losses in the core of the transformer is called as the iron losses or core losses and the stereo losses means it is going to basically see the stereo losses means it is going to depend upon the it is going to depend upon the output current and these are only 0.5% of the output power so these are very less so we are going to neglect it for all the ideal conditions and what are the losses that are going to occur in the insulation parts of the transformer it is called as the dielectric losses and these are only 0.25% of the output power. This is somewhat lesser when compared to the stereo losses also. So for all the practical reasons we are going to make with the stereo losses and also the dielectric losses. See constant losses means the constant losses means core loss and the dielectric loss. See core loss and the dielectric loss are always said to be constant losses whereas the variable losses are called as the copper loss and the stereo losses because copper loss is going to depend upon the load current and the stereo losses are also going to depend upon the load current. So that is the reason as the load varies the load current varies. So therefore simply we can see that these are said to be variable losses. So constant losses are always the core losses and also the dielectric losses because these are not depending upon the load current. Whereas the variable losses are nothing but these are always copper losses and stereo losses because these two are going to depend upon the load current. So whenever the load varies, the load current varies. So therefore these losses are also going to get varying. So, so because of this reason only we are going to call this as the variable losses. So finally I can say that in a transformer there are four losses which are called as the core loss, copper loss, dielectric loss and the stereo losses. Out of this the constant losses are the core losses and the dielectric losses and the variable losses are the copper loss and the stereo losses. See constant losses depends only on the supply voltage and the variable losses depends only on a on load current. I have already told you what are the constant losses they are going to purely depend upon the supply voltage only. If the supply voltage changes, the loss are also going to get changes and the variable losses depend only on the load current. So whenever the load changes, the load current varies. So therefore, this variable loss are also going to get vary. See as supply voltage changes, then cost of loss are also changes. Same thing I already told you. As supply voltage changes, these cost of loss are also going to get changes. So finally I can see that see cost of losses means these are the losses which are going to depend on the only on the supply voltage. So whenever the supply voltage changes, this cost of loss are also going to get changed and the variable losses are the losses which are going to depend on the load current. So whenever the load changes, load current changes, so this loss are also going to get changes. So finally I can see that cost of losses in a transformer are basically core losses and dielectric losses and the variable losses are the copper losses and the stereo losses. So already the cost of losses are going to depend only on the supply voltage whereas the variable losses are going to depend upon the load current. So whenever the supply voltage changes, the cost of losses are also going to get changes. So this is the point that you always have to remember. See now we are going to perform the no load test on a transformer. See no load test on a transformer I have already told you. So why we are going to find the no load test to figure out the shunt branch parameters of the equivalent circuit of a transformer. See for no load test we have to give the rated voltage. So for rated voltage means LV and HV. Out of LV and HV, MV winding has no rated voltage. So that is the reason we prefer to give we, we, we prefer to give the rated voltage on the LV side because its voltage is very less. So we can easily measure with the help of voltmeter. And what are the current which is present at this no, no load test is called as a input or you can say no load current. So always it is going to it is going to depend on the LV side by giving rated LV voltage. So on the LV voltage on the LV side we are going to give the rated LV voltage and the HV winding we are going to the oven circuit. So what are the no load current which is we can say ideally 5 to 8 percent of the rated LV current. So what are the rated LV current? So what are the rated LV current? It is only 5 to 8 percentage. So what are the no load current is nothing but only 5 to 8 percentage of the rated LV current. So therefore, what are the at no load condition? The amount of current drawn is only 5 to 8 percentage of the rated LV current. So simply we can say that what are the current drawn at the no load? INL is equal to only 5 to 8 percentage of the rated LV current and I already told you already the magnetizing component is very higher when compared to the core loss component so therefore always the power factor is very very low which is nearly equal to point to always the power factor is lagging in nature so therefore low power factor bad meter is like inside because the power factor is very less so we the power factor is very very small so if you want to measure this power factor so we need the low power factor bad meter is needed so if you want to measure even the small amount of power factor then we have to measure then we have to use the low power factor wall meters are needed to measure this values so therefore low power factor wall meter is needed to measure the amount of power consumed 
it is basically what are the power consumed at the neural tissues called as the pore loss so that we can figure out with the help of this low power factor what method because method because the power factor is very less so what are the power consumed at this neural tissues called as the neural power or core loss power so this we can measure with the help of low power factor what meter needed to measure the whatever the power which is drawn at this neural test on the transformer so short circuit test on the transformer so basically what is the short circuit test on transformer means i already told you with the elbow short circuit test we are going to find the series branch pair series branch parameters so if you want to do the short circuit test we have to give the rated current so if we have to do the rated current on the other side the voltage is less so current is very higher on the other side voltage is higher so current is very lesser so we prefer to do the we prefer to do the test on the means we are going to give the supply on the hv side because the rated current is very less than so hv side we are going to do the short circuit so therefore it is always done on the hv side so always supply the rated hv current by only 10% of the rated hv voltage because if you see basically we are going short circuit the hv side so therefore we have to give supply voltage so if you want to get the rated hv current then we have to use only 10% of the rated hv voltage so by using only 10% of the rated hv voltage we are going to get the rated hv current so by using only 10% of the rated hv voltage we are going to get the rated hv current so always supplying the rated hv current by only 10% of the rated hv voltage and i already told you now the power factor is very higher so power factor is very higher so therefore this is called as the high power factor what we need to need to measure the amount of power consumed by this test so whatever the power consumed during this test is called as a copper loss so what are the copper loss the full load copper loss because we are going to give the full load means what are the current passing is basically full load current so therefore we can say that here what are the copper loss is basically full load copper loss so therefore the power factor is very higher so therefore if you want to measure that huge amount of power factor and the what and the power needed so we have to use the high power factor what it is needed to measure the power consumed by the transformer during this short circuit test so therefore we need the high power factor what it is needed to measure that this much amount of power consumed by this transformer during this short circuit test it is basically full load copper loss so with the help of neural test we are going to figure out the core loss core loss and with the help of short circuit test we are going to figure out the full load copper loss If V by F is equal to constant, then the transformer never gets saturated. I already told you whenever the V by F is equal to constant. So V by F is equal to constant means the magnetic field density is also constant. So therefore flux is also constant. Then the transformer will never get saturated. So whenever the V by F ratio is equal to constant, then the transformer will never get saturated. This is a very important principle that you always have to understand. So therefore whenever the voltage by frequency is equal to constant, then the magnetic field density is a constant. Then flux is also constant. So therefore simply we can say that then the transformer will never get saturated. So whenever the V by F ratio is equal to constant, then the transformer will be never get saturated so total resistance loss is equal to area of the bs loop into frequency of the operation of the transformer supply i have already told you here area of the bs loop is going to tell you the amount of resistance loss happening only for one cycle of supply but if you want to find the for one second how much amount of loss is happening total resistance loss which is area of the bs loop into the frequency of operation of transformer supply supply because frequency is going to tell you the number of cycles in one second so if you multiply these two things we are going to get the amount of power loss in one second or simply we can say amount of energy loss in one second is nothing but power so therefore simply we can say power is equal to energy by time so how much amount of energy which is occurring in one second is called as the power loss so how much amount of energy you know how much amount of energy loss in one second is called as the power so therefore here this is area of the bs loop is going to tell you the amount of energy loss in one, in only one cycle amount of energy loss in one cycle but if you want to go for plus there in one second how much amount of energy is loss you have to multiply by frequency then you are going to get the this much amount of energy is lost by the with this much amount of energy is lost in the transformer in one second it is called as the hysteresis losses so because power is equal to energy by time so power is basically the amount of energy loss in one second so power is equal to the amount of energy loss in one second so therefore area of bh loop is going to tell you the amount of energy loss in one cycle of supply so if you want to find the amount of energy loss in one one second then we have to multiply by frequency because frequency is going to tell you the number of cycles in one second so if you multiply by these two things we are going to get the amount of energy loss in one second it is also called as the power so therefore total hysteresis loss is equal to area of the bh loop into 
frequency of the operation of the transformer supply. I already told you area of the BH loop. See B is nothing but which is the area of the BH loop unit is nothing but Ampere turns into Weber. So therefore area of the BH loop is nothing but the unit is equal to Ampere turn Weber. It is basically or simply we can say Ampere turn Weber is the unit of the area of the BH loop and the unit of the frequency is Hertz and the unit of the instance loss is equal to Watts. So finally we can say that the amount of instance losses is equal to the area of the BH loop is equal to the unit of the area of the BH loop is nothing but Ampere turn Weber and the instance loss the unit is nothing but it is a watt. So pH is called as the instance loss its unit is nothing but watt and the frequency unit is the Hertz. So therefore area of the BH loop unit is equal to Ampere turn Weber and the, uh, the unit of the instance loss is equal to watt and the unit of the frequency is Hertz. Thank <laughs> you.